ready to go and we have our uh, interviewees. So I'd like to call the meeting to order at this time. Good evening, Exeter. Uh, good evening to the board and uh, respective town staff. Um, those that are joining us in the Zoom meeting and those watching at home. As chair of the Exeter Select Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. On October 16th, 2020, public notice of this meeting was posted on the town website and on the bulletin board of the town offices at 10 Front Street. As provided in that public notice, the public may access the meeting online and via phone, and we remind you that the usual rules of conduct and decorum continue to apply. All votes tonight will be taken via roll call, and we'll start the meeting uh, by taking a roll call attendance. When each member of the board states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting and who that person is, which was required under the right to know law. Uh, we'll start with our vice chair, select woman Molly Cowan. Good evening. Good evening, Exeter. Um, I am alone. Okay. Select woman Roundtree Olaf. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am at home currently alone. Selectman Daryl Brown. Good evening. Good evening. I am at the Salt Cave alone. Okay. And our clerk, select woman Julie Gilman. I am at home and I am alone. And I'm Nico Papakostendis, and I am home and alone in this room. Also with us this evening is our town manager, Mr. Rustine. Good evening. Good evening. And um, we will start in with our first order of business. Uh, we have our final board interview for the Exeter Police Stakeholders Committee. Uh, Tanisha Johnson is here with us this evening. Hi, everyone. So good evening, Tanisha. Thank you so much for your application and your interest in this committee. As we've done with the other applicants, we'd like to give you a couple minutes to give us a, a little bit of background and your interest in the committee. And then each of the committee members will ask you a few questions. We'll be deliberating uh, within the next few weeks, at which point we'll be um, making um, nominations for appointments. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, so my name is Tanisha Johnson, and I have been an ex- Pennsylvania. Um, I have two children, one who is in Lincoln Street Elementary School and the other who is a freshman at Exeter High School. Um, I have worked in the community for the past four years and most recently increased my activism work with co-founding Black Lives Matter Seacoast and I have also been pretty active with the Racial Unity Team organization as a board member and program chair. Um, so that's a brief summary of who I am. Um, but my interest in being on this committee stemmed from my activism work um, and being involved in the community. And I feel that our law enforcement needs to be held accountable, but also there needs to be some more diverse individuals at the table to bring various perspectives to policies, to procedures, and make sure our chief of police and also the police staff are getting the DEIJ training that they need to get um, and be held accountable for what isn't right, especially in the world as we are right now. Great, thank you very much. Um, we will have the first the first two select board members to ask questions. We've been doing um, the two uh, select board reps to the committee. Uh, Selectman Brown, we'll start with you. Thanks, thank you for your application, Tanisha. Could you speak to the um, unique policing needs of, uh, in regards to economic diversity in the town? So this town of Exeter is not a diverse town um, by any means. Um, we are, very underrepresented as far as minorities in this town. And there is very little at the table when it comes to decision making, when it comes to reviewing policies and procedures, or even just being able to share our perspectives to how this town has been affected. Um, and that's just not on a cultural perspective, but it's also on an economic perspective as well. Um, there is, we know in this town, there are two to three sets, you either have the, the folks who are really in need of financial help, um, and then you have the upper class who usually are the ones in the seats at the table. And so when our police are out here doing work, um, they tend to not have the understanding and um, 
you know, perspectives of that middle and lower class. Um, and they don't have the cultural perspective at all either. And so I would like to be able to bring those various perspectives to the table and include those in what we're doing. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Select Woman Cowan. Hi, Tanisha. Um, I will ask the same question that I've asked all of the other applicants. Um, and that is, you know, what do you see is going well with the police department here in Exeter? And where are areas that you see could be improved? You know, I think what's going well is Chief Poulin is amazing. He really is open. He, you know, he listens, he reaches out to the community. Um, he wants to do better and he's encouraging his police staff to do better and his police officers to do better. He's bringing in training and groups to bring in conversations about different perspectives. So I think that is going very well. Um, what I think are what they can do better is really branching out to other towns like, you know, go to Manchester, go to areas in Massachusetts to understand what it really means to be in a town with higher crime, with a um, variety of cultures and understanding um, and get that educational piece, but also in what they're getting right now is very minimal. Um, and it's, I mean, if it's an hour a year, it's not enough to be able to understand how to really affect lives for who we're asking them to protect us. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for your application. Thanks. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Uh, thank you, Tanisha. I don't have any questions at the moment. And select woman Gilman. Uh, thank you, Tanisha. And I, you explained your interests and in, uh, in your um, desires to uh, serve on this committee. So I uh, have no question. Tanisha, before we conclude, do you have any follow up questions for the board? I do not. Okay. Thank you again for your interest, for your application. Uh, we'll be deliberating a couple of meetings and um, we look forward to um, your participation. And we also look forward to hearing from you later on in the meeting. Great. Can I just stay on and just mute myself? Do you Absolutely. Mind? Please do. Right. No, please Thanks. do. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, that concludes our board interviews. Next up, we have public comment. This is an opportunity for the public uh, to weigh in with any comments. We do ask, though, that if any of your comments have uh, any, uh, anything to do with the agenda, that you wait for that agenda item to come up. And I'll pause for a moment to see if there are any hands. OK. Seeing none, we'll close public comment at this time. We do not have any proclamations or recognitions, um, so we'll move on. We have two sets of minutes to approve. We have the minutes of the select, extra select board meeting of Monday, September 28th, 2020, and also the select board minutes for the meeting of October 5th, 2020. Uh, we'll start with September 28th. Are there any um, amendments or revisions to the minutes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the select board meeting minutes of Monday, September 28, 2020. So moved. Second. Motion any second. Further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, select woman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Select woman Cowan. Aye. Select woman Brown. Aye. Clerk says aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. We have Joanna Bartelli, our recording secretary, has joined us. Good evening, Joanna. Um, are there any revisions or amendments to the select board meeting minutes of Monday, October 5th, 2020? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the select board meeting minutes of Monday, October 5th, 2020. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Select woman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Select woman Cowan. Aye. Select man Brown. Aye. Clerk says aye. Mr. Chair? 
Aye. Motion passes. And unfortunately, we have a resignation from the Conservation Commission effective November 30th. Um, I regret to say that um, Lindsay White uh, is resigning her position as an alternate on the Extra Conservation Commission effective November 30th, 2020. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept uh, Lindsay's resignation. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, select woman Roundtree Olaf. Aye. Select woman Cowan. Aye. Selectman Brown. Aye. Uh, clerk says aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Lindsay, thank you very much for your work that you've done on the Conservation Commission. Okay, moving into our discussion items, uh, we have an election update. We have uh, our town moderator, uh, Paul Scafidi, as well as the supervisor of the checklist, Vicki Nowocek. Good evening, both. Good evening, Good evening Mr. Chairman. Hey, Vic. Hey, Paul. Uh, just thought we'd give you a quick update today, tonight, about what's going to be happening in uh, two weeks' time. Um, we know that right now we have received uh, well over 4,500 absentee request ballots. And I was at the town clerk's office today counting, just doing a random uh, amount of uh, checking with the envelopes that we've received. My best guesstimate right now, we're at 3,600 to 3,700 returned. Uh, absentee ballots. Um, so we're going to be very busy over the next two weeks because while I was there, there had to be at least, I was there for maybe 20 minutes today. There had to be at least 10 phone calls requesting absentee ballots. So this is going to be quite large, uh, long uh, process ahead of us. Uh, we're announcing, or I'm announcing that on our Friday, October 30th, we will be uh, opening the uh, pre-processing the absentee ballots at the Novak room at the town offices. Uh, if people want to come and watch, uh, we allow it. Uh, if people want to challenge, they have to be uh, challengers that are associated with a party and they have to have a letter from the uh, party chairman and I don't mean the local party chairman, I'm talking the state party chairperson, uh, stating that they are a registered challenger. They have to present the envelope so I can review it and allow it. Um, if you've seen the PSA I put out about a week ago, or this past Friday, I think it went out. It talks about what a challenger can do and what an observer can do. An observer has absolutely no status whatsoever other than to be there and watch. If they have a question, they have to ask me as town monitor, uh, moderator only. They're not to interrupt anything that we're doing. If a challenger makes a challenge about uh, a person's age, domicile, whether they were citizens or not, that goes to Vicki as the supervisor of the checklist. She makes that decision. If the challenge is something other than those three, then I make that decision. Um, and everything will be done uh, in that manner. Uh, affidavits will be available for challengers. If they want to uh, make a challenge, they have to sign an affidavit. You can't just challenge because you want to challenge. There has to be a reasonable uh, representative of why you want that challenge to occur. And if it's a legitimate, then we'll go through with it. Um, so uh, this is the first uh, announcement uh, we have, because we have to provide this, uh, the Secretary of State's office and, and the public the notification that we're opening the ballots a week from Friday, which is October 30th. So this will be our, uh, the uh, official uh, opening of that so people can be aware that they can be there. If the crowd gets too big, we will move it to the town hall across the way to keep uh, social distancing. Uh, there will be probably five to six people doing the counting. Um, we have to have myself plus three elected officials, of which the town clerk is one. 
Uh, the supervisor of the checklist this one. We will have uh, the system moderator will be there, uh, Kate Miller. Another system moderator will be there, uh, Dan Shotran. So we're covering that base. Um, we want everybody to know, or at least I want everybody to know, that the election, uh, the day of uh, November 3rd, that the polls that we did in September are going to be exactly the same. We're not changing it. We all agreed, uh, Vicki, myself, Andy Cole, the town clerk, uh, agreed it worked pretty well. Uh, we kept everything uh, rolling smooth and easy. Um, so this should be um, uh, a pretty easy time for us, we hope. We're 13,000 plus registered. Is that how many we have, Vic? Uh, almost 14,000. We've had a lot of new residents move to town and new voters. Okay. So with almost 14,000, they are predicting about 80% uh, turnout between absentee and in-person voting. Uh, when you talk uh, 80%, you're looking at almost 11,000 uh, registered voters that may come to the poll that day. Um, so we could see close to 4,500 absentees by the time we're done. Other than that, um, we're going to do as best we can with signage. There was some complaints about signage. We'll do a little bit better job. We're going to have uh, the uh, accessible voting uh, set up for automobiles on Linden Street at the Talbot Gym. Uh, that will be set up. We'll have areas blocked off uh, where everybody can stand holding signs, uh, keeping things orderly. Uh, if people want to be, uh, again, poll watchers, they can watch as long as they stay outside the ropes or outside the rails, as we call it. If they are challengers, uh, again, they have to, for the day of voting, they have to have a letter from the state uh, provided to us that who they are and what part of their party they are affiliated with. Um, other than that, um, people can still drop their ballots off at the town clerk's office during normal business hours. They do close Fridays at 1230. So if you come after that point, the box will be brought inside and you won't be able to drop it off. Uh, they are open late Tuesday night till seven. So other than that, you can bring it by. You can bring it by your absentee ballot the day of the election. Uh, drop it off there. You can drop it off at the town clerk's office the day of the election. And other than that, I think we're ready to rock and roll. Rick, your thoughts? Yeah, no, we are very ready. Um, the We just want to thank the community and those that have made a plan and have been registering early. Um, so they're not showing up at the polling stations the day of election. In 2016, just for historical reference, we had about over 900 brand new voters on election day. Um, since the primary in September, we've approved over 300. We have another pending of 169 right now. We don't know what has, uh, has arrived uh, over the past 24 hours or today. Um, we will be meeting again. We are meeting every Tuesday to approve voters to help with the process of processing our absentee um, ballots coming in. Um, and so our voters have an ability to track their ballots. So we, you know, first and foremost, huge kudos to our town clerk's office. It has been a Herculean uh, event for them um, to be able to manage their every day, as well as taking on uh, the 2020 election. So without them, <laughs> we wouldn't be where we're at. So huge kudos to them, uh, to my other supervisors that have been committed every Tuesday and coming in on their off hours. It has become a second job for all of us and we are proud to be doing this and are honored uh, that our, you know, our voting public has put us in position to be able to do what we are doing. So Paul Scafidi, thank you for also being mindful and keeping us all managed. Um, but, you know, please keep coming in and registering to vote prior to election day. It will make everybody's uh, day a lot easier. Our voters will, you know, even if you register prior to the election, you are still able to come in and vote that day. You don't have to take an absentee ballot because I do know there's a number of people that do want to actually be there in person. So 
you know, if you can, if you're not a registered voter and you have the ability to vote and have, you know, follow all of our qualifications, please register early. That way you're able just to walk in, grab your ballot, cast it and walk out. Um, but it has been a complete honor to serve for the community of Exeter. So I just want to also thank our select board. Um, your service on election day is going to be vital for us to be able to continue how we functioned in September. So really just a lot of gratitude all around. Um, so that's really all I have is, you know, vote early, <laughs> not early, but, you know, vote absentee if you can. Just be mindful. If you have friends and neighbors that need to vote, please consider bringing them to the polling places. Um, every vote counts. Every voice is worth hearing. So, um I just am advocating for everybody to get out and vote. So we're just grateful to have this time. And if the community or anybody has any questions, uh, you can gladly, you know, call me directly. A number of our voters have my personal cell phone. Lucky you. Um, but if you have questions, you also can email us. We are here to help serve and also answer any questions or concerns. That's all I have. All right. Um, if, if I could... Uh... Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm, I left out that you're going to be there that day as well uh, on the on the thirtieth. But uh, I thought you were letting me off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice try. It's not happening. No, I will be there. <laughs> but, um, I just want to put the rest of a couple things that there's been a lot of scuttlebutt uh, out there or, or, um, talking about some disruption or anything that might be happening at the polls. Um, nothing that we're hearing around town, but just statewide, nationwide. We're not anticipating anything happening. I think the uh, residents, the voters of Exeter uh, do a fine job of keeping everything uh, calm and cool and easy during the day. Uh, I'm not anticipating anything different. I believe that uh, we'll have a safe and easy election as long as just everybody has the patience that we've talked about in the past making sure that uh, they're all aware of what's going on. And I, I don't see anything uh, that's going to even come remotely close to what they're talking about. Not At least not not the exit of that I know and I've been working with for almost 30 years. So uh, I think it's going to be fine and an easy day for all of us. Just patience. And uh, we'll do this one more time the night before the election. So if anybody has any questions. We actually do. Uh, Select Woman Cowan and Select Woman Gilman in that order have their hands up. Um, hi, Vicki, and hi, Paul. Thank you so much for all you're doing as well. Um, and to Exeter residents, please please do vote. Uh, please vote absentee if you can. But I wonder if you could just say the dates one more time that you can request an absentee ballot. And then- what date can you, when can you return your absentee ballot? And what date can you not register in person at the town clerk's office if you are a new voter? So I'll start with the voter registration and then we'll work down to the ballots. Does that make sense, Paul? Go for it. <laughs> Great. So the final day you can register prior to the actual uh, November 3rd is Tuesday, November, uh, November, October 27 at 7 p.m. The supervisors of the checklist will be finalizing all of our applications, review of the applications and approving or, you know, putting someone in pending with, regarding any further information. The reason why we have to close the registration just for our voting public to understand is we actually need to be able to have time to print our ballot books and get those in order. So then we can pre-process the, the absentee ballots. And then on election day, come 7 a.m. once those polling doors open, there we are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Or if there's people still in line after the 8 p.m. close, we will still take your registration. So thank you for asking, Molly. But um, we are, you know, you can register all day, every day when the town clerk's office is open up until October 27th. And then we will be in session tomorrow from 7. So if a voter actually wants to meet with the supervisors, they can uh, tomorrow. And then, of course, on the 27th. And as far as absentee ballot requests, we take absentee ballot requests all the way up until November 2nd. Correct, Paul? Well, actually, um, yes, 
but you can go to uh, the town clerk's office the day of the election, the third, request an absentee ballot, fill it out right there, give it back to the town clerk's office. As long as you do that um, before eight o'clock, uh, it'll be taken care of. Uh, they'll bring it over to the town, uh, to the election site, and we'll run the process through once it's checked in. People can uh, mail in their absentee ballots, like we all know, but they have to be in the uh, town clerk's office by 5 p.m. on Tuesday. Uh, if they're coming in by mail, if they're not in at that point, they won't get processed. They'll be rejected. But you also can hand deliver your absentee ballot at the election. You can drive up to the uh, curbside, drop it off. You can actually walk it in the door and give it to uh, one of the ballot clerks or myself or the town clerk, and we'll process at that time. So we're going to do make sure that every ballot that we can get um, gets uh, processed. I will say that we've already gotten some ballots back that we've had to reject because uh, they sent back in the wrong envelope and there's no affidavit envelope in there. Uh, there's no sign. Um, and what we're doing is uh, the town clerk's office is trying to get in touch with those people to let them know that their ballot has been rejected the reason why it has been rejected. And now they have the time to come back to the town clerk's office, request another ballot and go and get it done correctly. So their absentee ballot will be counted. Uh, we've already had, I think we're up to 15 or 20 of them. Some of them have been wrong addresses. Uh, people, um, you know, put it in an envelope, forgot to put in the affidavit envelope. Some people sent the affidavit envelope and they forgot to put in the ballot, which is kind of weird. You know, it's the reason why we're doing this, but that's what they did. You know, so just be careful when you're doing it. Um, but if we see something uh, when we're opening them on the 30th, that gives the reason why I decided to do it on the 30th is it gives us Saturday, Sunday and Monday to contact people to tell them their ballot has been rejected, the reason why, and they can come down and request a new ballot. Does that answer the questions, Molly? Yes, and I forgot that I have one more question. Do you all need volunteers still? Uh, talking to Andy, uh, the town clerk today, we have quite a few people have come forward. If right. people want to give their name and number to the town clerk's office, they can still do it because we're going to be contacting people because we're going to have an informational on the 28th. Is that correct, Vicki, Wednesday? The 28th, yes. we're going to do our uh, training session and we're going to contact people. And um, if we get enough, we should be set. But we'll always take names and numbers and keep them on file just to be safe. Great. People have been asking me a ton and I've been directing them your way, but I figured I'd ask in public. No, here. no, we'll take them all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, Molly, to, and Molly, to that point is, you know, you never know the night before the election, you might feel ill, things might change. So having those names and numbers are valid and, and worth having. And then to Paul's point about our absentee voters. So when our uh, folks are requesting their absentee ballot via the application, I implore people to please include a valid phone number where we can reach you directly. That is how we are reaching out to our absentee voters. Typically in a registration um, for, you know, if you're registering to vote for the first time, we do not have access to that information on any of our voters. The only way we are able to reach out to our voters who are voting absentee is via that absentee form. So please, please, please put a phone number. An email address is great, but that's not rapid response. At least we can leave an urgent message with you and say, hey, we received your ballot. We need to speak to you and return our call. So thank you for asking those questions, Molly. And if anybody has any questions about registering, uh, they can always email us at soc at exeternh.gov. Um, and we can definitely guide you uh, with any of those questions, especially for some of our folks that 
are, you know, registered, want to register who are first time voters that are now college, you know, at college, that sort of thing. We are here. And for anybody at Phillips Exeter Academy who is of 18 years of age, they can also still register to vote. Um, I, I don't know what their status is on being welcome into the, the grander community of Exeter, but they can still uh, apply for an application via absentee and request that through the town clerk's office. So we just want to be sure that anybody and everybody who has the ability to vote is able to do so. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Select we really appreciate doing. the time. Thank you. Uh, now, Select Woman Cowan asked all the questions I was going to ask. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator and uh, Ms. Foot. Novoycek, <laughs> for your assistance and your your running this uh, campaign. I think it's or this voting. I think it's been really trying time, and you guys have uh, lived up to what we need. Thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and feel free to reach out to us. Thank both of you. Uh, we have another select board meeting, Mr. Moderator, next Monday night on the 26th. Would you like to come back? Uh, uh, to, yeah, if you think it's uh, positive uh, for us to do it, sure. Okay, we'd um, like that. So if you could put that on your schedule for next Monday night, that'd be great. We'll do it. And uh, there's a PSA out there. We talk about the absentee ballots, just to give that a plug. Uh, the people, um, I did it with uh, Exeter TV. So it's on the YouTube uh, channel 22 and all that stuff. But it's, in, it's important uh, before I, the last thing to leave everybody with, if you do an absentee ballot, please read the instructions and fill it out the way it states for you to do it. And make sure you sign the affidavit ballot uh, envelope, because if you don't, it's a pure reject. It's just the worst way you can lose your vote is by not signing that affidavit envelope. We need that. Of all things, that's the one we need. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for the town moderator or the supervisor of the checklist? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you again for your time tonight. We'll see you next Monday. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, with the board's indulgence, I'd like to move um, an agenda item up uh, to the next agenda. It was supposed to be, this was supposed to be the second discussion action item. And for some reason, there was administrative error, but um, I'd like to move up the Black Lives Matter Seacoast presentation. Uh, so I'm asking if the board will approve uh, moving that up to the next discussion item or if there are any objections. And no objection. seeing none, um, we have um, we have Tanisha Johnson and um, Clifton West, the uh, co-founders of Black Lives Matter Seacoast with us this evening. Um, are you both on the call? I am here, give Cliff one second to join. He's joining now. Absolutely. <laughs> And Cliff is here. Hi, Cliff, and welcome. Hello. How's everyone? Well, thank you. How are you? Doing good, doing good. Excellent. Um, so by way of history, on, um, on September 16th, the board received um, correspondence from Tanisha and Clifton, um, as did uh, other local officials, uh, with a request for an opportunity for change. And the select board included that in our packet at the September 28th meeting under correspondence. And after having a discussion, it was the consensus of the board that we really wanted to have uh, Tanisha and Clifton, both of you, come on and, uh, and give a presentation. And uh, as you know, I reached out to you the next day and gave you our meeting dates in October. And this date worked for both of you. And we're very happy to have both of you. Um, so I guess at this point, maybe I should turn it over to you for a presentation. And then we can have a discussion um, with you uh, amongst the board, if that's okay. And that sounds great, yes. Thank you. 
Um, so I'll just start off. So, you know, we as Black Lives Matter Seacoast, um, part of what we do is really making sure that we impact change, but also hold accountable those um, government entities to make sure that we are, you know, holding those accountable for trainings, for expense reports, for things that really ensure that BIPOC individuals and specifically Black individuals um, are treated in a way that's different from what's going on. What's happening in the world right now, Black lives are being murdered by police. Um, the justice system is not treating us fairly and it starts and it's not just up in the higher levels like board and with recent events in hampton uh, with the select board woman making the statements that she has made um, and saying the things that she has done. She has gone on YouTube live, you know, conversations and all types of things that has just been unethical. And the Hampton Select Board is really their answer was, well, we can't do anything because it goes against our code of conduct and our policies on voting individuals out um, and listening to the people, to the people want her out as well. And so when we went through and put our demands together as where we want to see change within our school board, within police, within um, town councils, select boards and everything else, we wanted to make sure that Exeter, you know, was held accountable as well. Um, there are two individuals of color on this select board. And when I watch these select board meetings, sometimes it appalls me at the way that they are treated at times. And it's it's unfair. And there is some biases. And I do feel like our select board needs to be held accountable as well to ensure that we are doing the things that we keep preaching. And we all preach that we are not racist, that we have addressed our biases and that we are open and inclusive and we are willing to do what it needs to be done to support our black lives, to support our BIPOC lives and any marginalized. And we wanna make sure that that's what's happening here. And so that's where these demands stem from. Um, some of them are very obvious um, and some of them are more, what we really wanna talk about is to updating the current code of conduct to make sure that there are rules in place that prohibit town employees from doing unethical behaviors on social media or speech, anything that's reckless or irresponsible, um, and that would otherwise express any bias towards race, sex, gender, disability, religion, or any other protected class. So I will let Clifton take over as well. I tend to do the introduction so he can continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> appreciate it, Tanisha. So definitely, uh, she touched on the code of conduct. So I'm gonna touch on probably the other pieces. Um, definitely, we want a investment to different uh, social services um, to be used uh, to uh, to be used to uh, assist the police officers and even take over some police calls. Uh, I feel like personally, I feel like we demand. Uh, change and innovation in so many different areas of our life, uh, whether that's education, technology, et cetera, et cetera. And I feel like law enforcement and how we approach, and really just in general, how we po approach policing needs that same type of innovation. So really uh, the investment to social, the, so, ah, the investment to social services is really trying to think of more innovative ways of how we can police and and uh, bring trust back into the community to our police officers and really engage some of the social services that are really uh, uh, are really better in the community uh, of Exodus now. So that's definitely another one piece of it. Another piece is definitely to implement a census review board uh, for extra law enforcement. And really this is going along, going along the side of uh, people not trusting police to investigate other police officers. Um, and really this census review board will handle those type of complaints uh, for extra law enforcement and provide that type of oversight for extra law enforcement to really try to bridge the gap uh, between civilians into between civilians and law enforcement. Um, so that's, I mean, 
that's really <laughs> the nuts and bolts of the of the demands that's focused on the select board city council. Um, and definitely I'm open to any questions or conversations around those topics. Great, thank you both. And I would like to open this up um, for the board. Um, if anybody has any questions or just discussion before we get into some of the, the bullet points here. Um, any members of the board have any comments or questions? I did have a question for um, Ms. Johnson. Have you presented this to other towns already at the board level? And what has that been like? We have presented this. We presented this about, oh, timelines are just all blurring now. But it was about a month ago when we did our Dover rally. And so we had several individuals actually sign the pledge. Um, we have a signed document of about six or seven government officials who pledged to work on these demands. And, you know, we know that this doesn't mean that tomorrow <laughs> these demands are going to be in place and everything's going to change. But we're looking for those to pledge to work on this, to have to say that we understand that we need to make some changes in how we do things, that we understand that the policies and procedures and rules and laws that were made umpteen years ago may no longer be, be applied right now in this world as we know it, that there's that we need to start looking at these rules that were built on systemic oppression and systemic racism um, of all cultures and everything else and the isms that are going on in this world and it's time for a change. And that's what we're asking for those to pledge on. And so we did send these to Hampton. Um, we are actually talking to the chief of police and all the surrounding towns as well. And so we are making some headway in those saying, you know what, we're open to the conversation. And that's what we're looking for. We want individuals to be open to the conversation and be held accountable to say yes and not afraid to say I'm open for the conversation and to say, you know, there's things we need to work on as an organization or in your cases as select board to make sure we're doing what's best for our people. And that means all people. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Has, and of those who have signed, have, uh, what's been their public capacity? Um, Cliff, go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, we have uh, house reps. Um, and we did have a few C councilors uh, from Rochester and uh, Summers Road. And uh, I've been in discussions with the C councilors to make an official presentation uh, to those C councils. Thank you. Thank you, Selectman Brown. Uh, Selectwoman Gilman, you have your hand up. Yes, I was also curious about what other, other towns have been uh, um, uh, have reacted um, because of the way the letters addressed to candidates. I was just a little curious because I'm a candidate, but no one else that I know that's running has been approached by this. Um, and that's just a policy. That's just a procedural issue. It's not um, a, a big deal to me. Um, I would like to speak to you, Tanisha, offline about what you've noticed about um, our behavior being um, discriminatory because, you know, I, I, just, I don't see it, but I'm not looking at it the same way you are, I suppose. Um, some of the things in the, in the list of demands have actually been enacted at the state level. Um, so you might want to uh, review that a little bit. Um, the chokehold aspect has already been legislated. Um, and what's the other one? Um, officers reporting the behavior of, an, of another officer. That's already state legislation. Um, the issue about um, the recall has been decided in the court that towns can't do that. Uh, it's unfortunate, I, but there's no mechanism for recalling an elected official. Um, this, but I understand this is what you want us to do as elected officials is fix that. Uh, and I have no problem with trying to find a solution to that. And if you have a recommendation, uh, now's the time to give it because uh, we're writing our, our um, proposals, our, our legislative proposals now. And we have until uh, November 
well, November 4th is the next start date. Uh, we have about a week and a half after that to, to submit more requests for legislation. Uh, so it would be great to get uh, more, more specific information of what you want to see. Um, yes, we have been contacted by several individuals to um, get with them and discuss legislative changes. So we are working on that with a few representatives as well. So it's unfortunate that you weren't, you know, that you didn't know about these as we, this has been all over through social media. You know, our rallies have been all over newspapers, you know, Exeter newsletter. So they've been, you know, out very in various locations. So um, it's unfortunate that you weren't able to see these demands because it definitely had press. Yes, it had press, but I have to say it's addressed to candidates. And so I expect it to actually be addressed. Uh, it's addressed to chief of police, it's addressed to school board, it's addressed to several individuals. And so being that it was in the press, we did not reach out to every single candidate. They reached out to us if they wanted to be a part of this. Okay, well, I thank you for that response. Um, it's just a... I thank you for that response. I did see the things that were involved and I have to tell you, um, I did not go to your events because I am not going to large events at this point. Um, so that's part of the reason why you haven't had the opportunity to speak to me in person. Well, I understand COVID is a nightmare. <laughs> we are still in it, yes. Um, and also somewhere in the list, and uh, forgive me for not well, knowing or not remembering which level of, of government you want to deal with this, um, all of the things that have to do with marijuana have been uh, uh, addressed at the legislature, or almost all of them. Um, the issue of uh, uh, the felony convictions for carrying marijuana have been reduced to anyone with three quarters of an ounce or less uh, is not, uh, has not, is not uh, accused as a felony. We tried to make it one ounce, but the Senate cut it down to three quarters of an ounce. Uh, a couple of the other things along that, with that line are, be, are being uh, proposed this year for another, another session. Um, the governor vetoed one at some point. Uh, the total legalization of marijuana uh, was the governor's uh, uh, veto. And for right now, that's what I remember. I'll have to look at the list again and see if I have other comments. But I thank you for bringing this forward to us. Thank you, Selectwoman Gilman. Selectwoman Cowan, you had your hand up. I do. Um, thank you both for coming. Um, and I am... Uh, I would like to explore a little bit more, um, not at this time, because I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but just about how people feel that they've been treated, because that's something that is serious and is troubling and not the kind of board that I want to participate in. So um, I'd like to work with the chair and members of the board to make sure that we're addressing that concern. Um, and I am really happy Tanisha, that we were able to interview you. And I was also happy to meet with you with Lovey this summer um, to talk about your participation in the police commission that we have, because I agree with you. I think that there needs to be significant um, change and, and responsibility. And so it, this, the demands are a little bit different than what I understood your um, your position during the summer. But, you know, I'm, I'm just really glad and thankful that you're participating. And then I also want to point out that we have another um, BRC seat. <laughs> um, if you want to take on some responsibility in actually crafting with us the police um, budget. There are, there are lots of opportunities to participate. If you don't wanna officially be on the budget recommendations committee, you're certainly welcome to sit in on the meetings and help you know, with, with our um, official committee to craft and create that budget. Absolutely, thank you for the offer. We can talk offline and I can get more details about that. <laughs> I know, I don't wanna be like, hey, you should take on all of these things, but I also, <laughs> want you to have the the opportunity um, and not exclude you at all. So there is that opportunity and I would love to have your participation. Absolutely. Thank you, yeah, thank you both for coming. Yeah. Uh, Selectwoman Rontriola, do you have any questions or comments? 
I don't have any comments or questions for Cliff or Tanisha. They know where I stand. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dean, do you have any questions? Uh, <clears throat> not at this point. No questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to uh, thank Tanisha and, and Clifton for coming tonight and uh, appreciate the chance to listen to both of you and uh, look forward to talking with you further. Thanks. M Mr. Dean, if I could put you on the spot real real briefly, could you, could you speak to um, the current code of conduct, conduct that we have for our town employees regarding social media? Yeah, sure. So um, as far as our personnel policy goes, yeah, with the town, we, we have a pretty comprehensive, in my opinion, but of course, always willing to talk with people about it, uh, policy against harassment. And it's just when we talk about harassment, sometimes we think of it as just uh, the sexual nature of harassment, which is sort of the, you know, sort of the historical main area that we're focused on with HR. But uh, our policy actually goes further than that. Uh, and I'll just read a little bit from it. I'd like to do that. Uh, it says harassment is verbal and or physical conduct that denigrates or shows hostility or aversion toward an individual because of his or her race, color, sex, pregnancy, national origin, age, religion, disability, marital status, sexual orientation, or veteran status, or that of his or her relatives, friends, or associates in that one has the purpose or effect of creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Two, has the purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with an individual's work performance. Or three, otherwise adversely affects an individual's employment opportunities. So, um, you know, it's, this is definitely something that we have a policy and procedure on in the town. And we obviously take these things uh, quite seriously when we get claims and they're uh, investigated fully whenever we do. And in terms of social media, I'm just, if you can bear with me for just a second, we have, um, we do have a policy on that with the town at large, first of all, uh, we have a social media policy. And then for um, employees, we also have one as well. And I'm just digging it up. Our personnel policy is quite extensive. Um, we have a standards of conduct uh, provision as well in our personnel policy and social media is addressed here. So uh, we have a category that's called other. Um, and I'll just, I'm actually gonna try to bring it up here real quick. Uh, in our personnel policy right here, we have, it mentions MySpace, so maybe this was done in 2012, so maybe it's already a little outdated, but uh, we have social network and networking and blog postings. Uh, that is a policy that we have that regulates um, how we use internet, how we use uh, postings on social networking, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth. Um, so we, uh, prohibit the policy prohibits employees from any postings viewing or in any way participating in such sites uh, while on work time or using any of the resources or equipment of the town. Um, and so we're supposed to be using it in an official capacity only. Um, and so these are, there's also a policy Sorry. statement about encouraging or discouraging. Uh, we don't encourage or discourage any employees from posting on social networking sites or blogging their own time using their own equipment. However, employees should be aware that the postings are public. So. Mr. Dean, um, I think Select Woman Roundtree Olaf has a question. Sure. No, it's not a question. Just sorry to interrupt. Uh, Select Woman Cowan, her, her router came unplugged. So she'll be back as soon as she can. Oh. Just letting you guys know. Oh, thank you. Okay. That's why she's. Yeah, so we have, anyway, we do have a blogging and a social networking policy uh, that we continue to look at and try to update periodically. Um, but we also have, you know, provisions in here that, um, you know, if you're referencing the town in any way, you have to state that your the views, opinions, ideas, or information belong to you personally or not in any way attributable to the town. And then the postings must not violate any laws or policies of the town. Uh, including but not limited to harassment, violence, 
or confidentiality of other employees or residents. So we do have quite a few provisions in our current policy that address social media. And, uh, you know, again, we'll continue to review that in context. And obviously, if we uh, hear of anything that is of a nature that really would be unacceptable uh, to us uh, with regards to harassment or threatening or bullying or something like that, you know, we're going we're going to pursue that and we're going to look into it. And uh, we have done that. Thank you, Mr. Dean. But it looks like if this was done in 2012, that we do need to um, seriously revise this and clean it up a little bit to bring it up to. Yeah, my space not so hot anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Um, hot in say, yes, because um, there's lots of ways that you know definitely was missing in that uh, what you just read to us um, that definitely doesn't capture a lot of things that are happening right now. Um, and technically, with what you read, what happened in Hampton would not fall under what you read to us. So definitely, I would say it's time for us to update that and make sure it's very inclusive um, to the needs of the people at this time. And we are very open to that. I'm so glad, yes. Select woman Gilman, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I just, I think I might have said it, but just to reiterate for uh, Ms. Johnson and Mr. West, that some of the things that are listed in different categories um, ha really are appropriate at a state level if we want to make this consistent. I, I, I'm right. We're just talking about the select board, right? Because there is a section that's specific to just select board only. We weren't talking here tonight about what we're presenting at the state levels and other areas. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions for Tanisha or Clifton? Oh, I did have another one. <laughs> when we start talking about solutions, um, I was looking up uh, what's going on today. And, and, you know, the governor's had this task force and they've written their report. Um, a couple of pieces of legislation have come out of it. Um, now, where is that taking me? <laughs> yes, our fellow, just so you know, our fellow uh, Black Lives Matter chapters, they do sit on that task force. So we are quite aware what comes out of it as well. Mm -hmm. Now I remember what it was. Um, you, you recognize, you've already told us that um, it, uh, this isn't a short fast thing that we can get accomplished, which I, you know, I would love to do, but um, there are agencies that have to be involved and connected. And one of the things that um, when I was looking that occurred to me was that a lot of the um, uh, issues and, and, you know, your, your platform goes beyond just the racial um, diversity and, and, uh, and behavior behavior of, of people towards people of color. Um, some of the interactions that you're calling for uh, some rulemaking on involve, would involve the fire department actually because they do deal with the overdose actions or the you know calls from people with someone out of control or you know mental health issue and so i just wanted to put that in the mix as when we're when we're convening uh, a group or changing legislation that we have to think beyond just the police department you are absolutely right and that's why we work with multiple organizations to work on things like these because these are all issues that affect the marginalized people especially youth of color black youth um, homelessness substance abuse mental health are all factors that contribute that if we put our money and resources towards it can have a huge impact on the change of what affects our people and so I agree with you. Um, we didn't, if we put everything that we did on this piece of paper, it would be a hundred pages long. Um, <laughs> but if you would follow us and actually, you know, maybe sit down and talk with us, we can definitely let you know as much work as we have been doing in the community to address these things. So. Sure. And, and um, one thing I'd want to put out there is that this whole pandemic issue has caused a lot of havoc with uh, shelters and, and, uh, like Seacoast Mental Health requires an appointment. And sometimes when an issue happens, you don't have time to make an appointment uh, or, you, you know, 
what are our police officers supposed to do with someone while well, they're waiting for an appointment? So there are things like that. We need to talk to all the different services to uh, what can we change during a time like this? Uh, there's got to be a there's got to be a way. Great, thank you. Any other questions or, or comments? Denise and Clifton, thank you for coming this evening um, to, again, begin this discussion. It doesn't stop here. Um, I'd like to reach out to you um, and maybe schedule a Zoom meeting or if you're open to meeting in, um, you know, in person. Um, I'd like to go through some of the bullets with you as it pertains to Exeter um, and go over what we're already doing and then maybe get some feedback from you as to, you know, what we can do to make it better. Um, so I, I'd like the opportunity to do that. I'll reach out to you tomorrow and get some dates from you. Um, and I too would also like to speak with you about um, the conduct of the select board. And I would also uh, invite uh, any of the select board members to reach out to me offline uh, to speak about their concerns. And thank you for bringing that to our attention this evening. Absolutely. And thanks for having us. You know, I look forward to the opportunity to talk about things um, as well as perception and things we don't realize that we do. It's part of our internal biases of how we treat others. It's not always, you you know, we don't say that folks are your racist or doing anything like that. But when we have these behaviors that mimic um, our internal biases that are not examined and you look from an outside view, um, things look a lot differently, especially when and you do the work to change yourself and be anti-racist. And so it's it's a heavy load and it's a lot of work we all need to do, but I do urge that you all do that. And we look forward to having more conversations, especially in holding everyone accountable. Thank you both. And I'll be in touch with you tomorrow. We can set up some dates and we look forward to having you back to a future select board meetings too. Awesome. Bye everybody. Have a great night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Good night. Okay, next on our agenda, we have the Riverwoods Tax Agreement. Mr. Dean, I'll let you uh, take that. Okay, I was just finding my spot. Uh, so this is, uh, these are annual agreements that we have with Riverwoods. Uh, they're presented to the board of each year about the same time and basically spell out what, how Riverwoods uh, in the town, what the taxation relationship is between the, the two entities. So there are three agreements here. They're pretty much boilerplate. Um, and again, the, it describes basically the, uh, the agreement talks about things like, and I'm once again, I'm gonna pull up the packet here. So this is the one for the main uh, campus, Riverwoods right here. And it talks about how the taxes are broken down between uh, the residential units, the nursing home, and the remainder of the facility. And basically, when you add all this up, it works out to about, and I believe it's about an 83% taxable versus 17% non-taxable. That's been the historical allocation between the taxable and the non-taxable. Um, so these agreements are presented to the board every year, like I said, and then they are voted to be approved by the board uh, as part of the uh, pilot. I guess I'd call it a pilot payment in lieu of taxes, but it's really tax payments. So um, the Ridge is here as well. And also there, there's an agreement for the Boulder. So it covers the three main components of the Riverwoods campus. and happy to answer any questions that I could answer. Well, I was going to ask if there was anybody from uh, DTC this evening to speak to this or? I see a phone number, but I don't know who it is on the attendee list. Okay. I don't see a hand going up. No. Okay. Um, I would suggest though that um, this document needs to be revised. Um, Selectman Brown's last name is spelled incorrectly, so that needs to be fixed. Yes, and these documents were provided to us. They are provided to us by Ms. Summers, so we'll, we'll have that okay. correct. Thank you. Are there any questions of the board for Mr. Dean? Seeing none, 
Seeing none. So do you need individual motions for each agreement, Mr. Dean? Um, I believe I would prefer that because there are three separate agreements. Okay. So the three motions would be for... The ridge, the boulders, and the, boulders. the main campus, I would call it, and the Riverwoods okay. main campus. All right. I'll try a motion. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that the board enter an agreement with uh, Riverwoods for the tax commitment for, hold on, let me get to the right page for the woods. Do we have a second? Uh, could I ask a question, Mr. Chair? Just, uh, yes, of course. Uh, so is Riverwoods operating as a for-profit entity in the town? I'm uh, just sort of curious if their rates have gone up. I'm not sure if it's relevant to this decision, but um, you can just sort of want to put it on the record that it's a, whether it's a for-profit and then um, if their rates have gone up, um, you know, we should sort of have that uh, understanding before we do that, I think. No, and that's, and that's a good point. Mr. Mr. Dean, can you answer that? Um, I believe uh, Riverwoods is owned or was organized at least at one point as a not-for-profit, as a non-profit. So that would be my answer to the question. I think they were owned by Life Care, or I, I believe that could be the name of it. Um, but I have always understood that they, have, they are a non-profit. And I do not know about any rate increases recently there. I don't know anyone who lives there. Well, I do know people that live there, but I don't know what they're paying to live there. Sorry about that. Need to make that distinction. Again, this is officially a pilot. It is a payment in lieu of taxes. That's how we describe it. But we, again, the, it's, it's a pilot, but it's not a pilot. And the reason I'm saying it that way is because the agreement actually refers to actual tax payments. Yeah, yeah so normally like a pilot would be for a hospital or... Something. Right. A pilot is traditionally, you know, a payment in lieu of taxes. But this this is really a, more of a tax agreement because it lays out the schedule of what Riverwoods will actually pay the town in terms of taxes and how it will be taxed. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, Charlie Tucker, some years back, he, he used to come to meetings and describe the legislation that was passed that actually exempts the nursing home. Uh, my understanding was back in the 90s when Riverwoods started, there was an RSA uh, in RSA 72, a portion of RSA 72 that was added to exempt the nursing home uh, component of these kinds of facilities from taxation, which is why it's it's not taxed. Yeah, I just I would recommend that we take a little time on this one because it can look like under another lens it would look like we're uh, giving a set aside to a business. Uh, it may already you know, we're we're sort of helping a margin without. Um, you know, I'd like a little bit more understanding on what we're doing here um, to which entity in Riverwoods and yeah. Okay, I did indicate to Ms. Summers that there were two new board members, so we may have questions about this. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to bring it back next week and maybe coordinate her being on the call to be able to talk with the board about it. I think that would be best, Mr. Dean. Yeah, and, and again, I've, we've never had a situation before where these agreements weren't signed. So I've never, <laughs> I've never had to answer the question what would happen if they weren't signed. Uh, but as Riverwoods is our one of our top two taxpayers, uh, certainly we want something in place to be able to send out our tax bills to them. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. Dean, you'll arrange that. Uh, Selectwoman Gilman, would you like to withdraw your motion? I, with my, I withdraw my motion regarding the Riverwoods tax agreement. Thank you. And we'll revisit this next week. Great. Before we get into our Kingston Road project update, I know we have um, 
uh, DPW Director Perry here. Uh, good evening, Jennifer. Good evening. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. Um, just real quickly before we get into our uh, Kingston Road project update, um, before I forget, Select Women Roundtree Olaf um, had a question for you, uh, which does not pertain to this. So, Select Women Roundtree Olaf. Hi, Jennifer. How are you doing? Good, thank you. So, nothing, you know, crazy, serious, but I just wanted to have a quick conversation about our trash bags. Um, it's been brought up to my attention from other residents and also just me being a resident of town that there have been some issues getting access to them during certain times over the last couple of weeks. They've been sold out in different areas like um, supermarket and RJ's um, and also the price increase. So the affordability and I'll, I'll say the robustness. How about that? Of some of the bags and their integrity um, when people are paying $2.50 a bag and they're deteriorating before they even get to the curb. Um, I don't know what we can do about it or the conversation that we can have, but I think it's something that we need to discuss because I know for some people it's really, it, affordability is, is, is a tough thing when it comes to the trash bags. And since we don't have a town sponsored um, compost program that I'm aware of. It, it seems like we need to figure out a way, if possible, to, to make this a little more affordable, especially during these times. Big question that, you know, obviously <laughs> I didn't prepare you for, but something to, to consider if we can talk about it at some point, sooner rather than later, I guess. Absolutely. Um, we'd be happy to talk with you in detail. We, I should let you all know that um, Jay Perkins, our highway superintendent, who's oversees the, the program in general, he and I met with the vendor who provides our blue bags because we had heard there were some complaints about um, the bags not holding up that sometimes seams would split or the ties would pull out, um, which is another problem with uh, the integrity of the bags. And we did express to them our concerns that that, that is not acceptable. Is um, going to hold up for the customers. And um, the, the vendor, that's Waste Zero, um, had indicated that if people ever do encounter bags of poor quality like that, that they sh should return them to the store where they can be swapped. Um, they don't have to send them to anybody. They can just go back to the participating retail outlet and swap them for a new role. Um, they can also do that at Public Works. Um, so those are two locations where people can, you know, access the right bags. The vendor explained that sometimes when they start a new run, that the bags may not be up to the snuff and that's that what they suspect they actually looked at what they had in stock when we made the initial call to them and everything that they tested was fine so it's likely that it was something that occurred during the beginning of a run um and they do attempt to anticipate they do anticipate that and they do check them but i think we all know that sometimes those things get through so I just want people to know that there is an opportunity for replacement for any bags that don't meet spec um, and people should take advantage of that. As far as the affordability, I know that is, it is a very challenging uh, thing. Our blue bag program is designed to somewhat subsidize the cost of our solid waste and recycling program, which is over a million dollar program. Uh, the blue bags, the cost of the blue bags or the revenues that come in are approximately $600,000 a year. So that's about 60% of the cost of the solid waste program. Um, and we know that they're expensive. They're not obviously, no, uh, it's not what the bags themselves cost. It's what the cost of the program is. I completely agree with you. It would be nice to be able to find other alternatives. I mean, a, a major component of the waste um, weight is 
food waste. Um, that's a, a big component. Or, you know, organics are probably anywhere from 15 to to 20 percent in some households. And if people are not composting at home, you know that they are paying for that disposal. So um, I think it is time um, to look into some other options for people. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. And, you know, hopefully, I know that there are a couple of vendors out there currently who who offer up composting services, but it would be great if in the short or long term, our town could somehow um, have more access to that for residents who are looking to decrease their footprint and also the cost of disposing of uh, waste from their homes. So thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Mr. Dean, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to add a couple of quick comments. One was that our solid waste program for 2021, the budget is uh, actually 1.135 million. So if you look at, I, I just wanted to reinforce Jennifer's point about the blue bags because I've followed some of the conversation online and despite all of our efforts, we still don't make uh, enough headway, I guess, with the idea that the $2.50 bag cost is not just covering the cost of the bags, it's covering the program. And the other thing is we hadn't increased the cost of the bags. Uh, the last rate increase we did in 2018, I believe it was, uh, was our first bag increase in nine years. So the one before that was 2009. And it was a 50 cent increase per bag when we made that change. And uh, the solid waste costs in the interim had increased exponentially by comparison. So, you know, again, it's just to educate people about what's going on out in the market. And I agree with Jennifer, it's a great area to keep working on to see if there are other alternatives or options. Um, and just wanted to, to state that and so forth so people understood it. Great. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer, we'll have you um, give us an update, please, on the Kingston Road uh, shoulder widening and sidewalk project, please. So the Kingston Road project is, um, is being funded through the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Um, we were the recipients of a grant, uh, a, a transportation alternatives program, um, what we fondly call TAP grant in the industry. Um, and obviously town funding too. We, the town is paying for the, the, the balance, the 20% of the project. But whenever the town does participate in a project like a TAP project, um, New Hampshire DOT has a lot of um, requirements. Actually, they're federally based requirements that we have to meet. Um, it's, there's a lot of checks and balances. We have to get approvals, not only from you, the select board, to take the next step. We frequently have to receive um, authorization and a notice to proceed from New Hampshire DOT. So the timeline of a TAP project, um, frequently we, we add an extra year to those projects. These are not, you know, quick turnaround projects. I just wanted to kind of set the, the, the stage for that. Um, we've been working on this project since about 2015. Um, and we started off initially with just a shoulder widening um, approach. It did not include a sidewalk, but during the uh, initial public meetings, which are an essential part of these projects, we, we do have neighborhood and public information meetings so that we can get feedback from residents. It was determined that there needed to be a sidewalk component to this project, at least for the first um, couple thousand feet. And so we had to go back because it was an increased cost. We did go back to the voters in March of 2017 with a warrant article that extended the timeline and extended or increased the amount of the project. Um, that was authorized at a $1.129 million dollars um, with New Hampshire DOT paying 80% or $896,000 of that project. And so in 2017, after we did receive the um, affirming vote at town meeting, 
we did commence with the final design of a, um, a sidewalk component to the, the project. And um, I did provide a timeline on the second page of the memo, if people are interested in, in the specifics of how things proceeded. Um, but we essentially were working on, excuse me, the preliminary design by January of 2018. And we did receive a, a notice to proceed from New Hampshire DOT in March of 2018 to um, go forward with the final design. And final design started in April of 2019. And almost, it was the end of August, almost September of 2019, when we did complete the final design. Um, we still were awaiting some permits. We were still awaiting wetlands permits at that point in time. Um, you can see that came in later in September of 2019. And we have been working on acquiring easements since that time. We, we started the easement um, procurement process back in May 2019. It was July that we did receive authorization from DOT to go forward with the easements. And we sent letters out in August of 2019. One of the challenges is um, September of every year is a critical time as far as these New Hampshire DOT projects go. And it was pretty apparent that we were pushing up against the um, their um, schedule deadlines that we were not going to be able to make the September 9, 2019 deadline for having all of our easements, having all of the um, permits in line before we could go um, be authorized to go out to bid. And so we've been in a bit of a parking lot with New Hampshire DOT. They've indicated that the next time that we would be able to go onto the queue for construction would be in their fiscal year 2023. I believe I, I mentioned that at the last meeting. Um, our intent is though to extend the timeline that's in the town warrant article so that we can go out beyond 2023, um, anticipating that we would most likely be eligible to be in the queue sooner than um, October of 2022, which is their beginning fiscal fiscal year of 2023. Um, and that's where we're at right now. And we have um, revamped our efforts to get the, um, the last of the easements. We do have some. Um, we do have a few more to get to. It's a little bit more challenging during COVID, but that's not the only reason. I did want everybody here to understand that there were a lot of challenges trying to meet the um, September 2019 timeline, and we just couldn't make it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Are there any questions from the board for Ms. Perry? Selectwoman Gilman. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Perry, for uh, our, uh, giving us the presentation. I just had a quick question. Um, I know DOT or TAP follows a federal guideline, but there are no federal funds involved with this set, correct? Uh, indirectly, yes, that's correct. Um, the monies are chan these are federal monies that are channeled through New Hampshire DOT, and that's why there are so many federal guidelines and federal requirements that we have to meet. Um, but it's New Hampshire DOT that determines what projects are eligible and at what amount. So it's a it's a state administered program, but there are there are federal monies involved. All right, so that brings me to the question about Section 106 <laughs> over that long area. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. It brings up the next question about federal funds and these kind of projects with a Section 106 uh, survey, historical survey. I believe there was one that was conducted um, early on in the permitting process that would have been going on in 2019, but I might be wrong about that. You 
I just don't recall. Yeah, I just don't recall seeing it, but that doesn't mean it. I, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yeah, I will follow up. I will check on that and okay. get back to you. Any other questions from the board? I do know there was uh, public interest in this update, um, so I'm going to switch over to the attendees and see if there are any questions. And I see one hand up, um, Laura Not has a question, if we could let her in, please. Hi, this is Laura. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Laura. For the record, could you please state your address? Sure. This is Laura Knott. I am at 15 Tamarin Lane in Exeter. Um, I thank you for putting this on the agenda, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have a couple questions um, for Ms. Perry. Um, the first is... Um, I'm unclear as to what what was occurring between March of 2018 when the preliminary design was approved by New Hampshire DOT and then um, April of 2019, so almost a year when the final design was submitted to New Hampshire DOT. Um, is that a typical timeline for a final design to be submitted approximately 11 months? It is, it's not uncommon. It is a little bit longer than you might think for a project of this, this scale. Um, but again, I'd remind everybody that it is a, um, it is a TAP grant. And so it does have to go through all of the approvals with New Hampshire DOT. We have to have all of our permitting included before we, we submit that. Um, and as you could see, the the wetlands permits and alterations of terrain permits were kind of rolling in around that time. And before we can submit those permit applications, the, pro the project pretty much has to be in final design. It's usually at about a 90% design um, point. So, you know, these they do take time. Um, I wouldn't say that this is, is extraordinary. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is, um, we as a town voted to increase the project funds, which you mentioned in your, in your letter. Um, so we were taxed uh, for those increases, I believe, um, in 2017 or after the 2017 um, town meeting uh, when that was approved. Um, the town agreed to, to add an additional $305,000 um, of our own funds. So, so oh, I'm sorry, $185,000 was raised by taxation and the rest was from, from NHDOT. Um, so because we've been taxed on that money, where is that money sitting right now? And is it safe? I mean, is, it, is, it, is there a chance that it could be used on something else in the meantime? A good question, and I'll also let the town manager weigh in. But when we do, um, this is a warrant article. And so all of the monies that are appropriated through a warrant article are dedicated specifically to this project. Okay, thank you. And then my, my concern related we were told in 2017 when we were reviewing the, the town Twenty fifteen to 2017. Um, here we are now in 2020 and we're looking like it might not happen till 2023. So in that case, who then will pay for that cost increase when the project, you know, is completed eight years after it was voted on? So when we were looking at costs back in, in the 2017 period, we were anticipating that the project would be constructed at least another year um, or two out there. So the, those kind of inflation factors were already rolled into this project. And I did confirm um, with the engineering team earlier that whether or not these prices, um, these costs were still relevant or if there needed to be any other um, increase. And I was told that we have um, all the the engineers' opinions of cost indicate that we should be under this amount. Okay. So my 
my next question will be that if we are not under this amount, the town will then have to vote again at another Warren article at another town meeting to add more money to this project that was approved five years ago or four to five years ago. So I guess I just asked the board and I ask the DPW to accelerate this project as much as they can within the NHDOT. I mean, I'm, I'm kicking myself now because if I had known that the deadline to submit to NHDOT was in September, I would have uh, emailed you sooner <laughs> um, and, and gotten on the agenda earlier. Um, but now that I know that it's in September, we will be holding um, the town accountable for making sure that we've submitted everything um, by next September, at, at certainly at the latest. Um, but if there's anything that can be done to accelerate this project, I mean, we moved here in 2012 and my first priority at that time was let's get sidewalks. And when I saw that it was happening in 2015, 2016, um, I got really excited you know, we since that time, though, that this has been approved, um, I have gotten married. I have a two year old son um, and I really would like to see these sidewalks done so that he can he can walk to Dino Park with us. We can travel safely on 111. And um, I think right now there's a lot of kids that are traveling up and down 111 to visit friends, biking, um, going into town to try to do things while they're home and it's very unfortunate that, you know, in this lockdown situation of COVID that we still don't have these sidewalks in place. Um, I know the, the planning board just recently approved a proposal for an additional number of houses to be added to off of Tamron Lane. Um, so that's going to be some more homes that are going to have access to these sidewalks once they're built. Um, so I would just really ask the board to try to push this issue forward as much as possible and accelerate the timeline on this. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Mr. Dean, did you have anything to add? Um, just wanted to reinforce the notion that the money that was appropriated is set aside for this. So um, I know Jennifer spoke to that a little bit, but just to reaffirm that and uh, Ms. Knott has obviously done her homework and the 185 is correct. Um, that, that was the additional town funding that was raised back in 2017. So um, that's that. And we'll continue to work on the project. We do need the easements, obviously, to make this happen. And that's a big part of it. So we need to push those ahead. So I'd like to, before select woman Gilman asks her question, I'd like to suggest, Mr. Dean, that we have periodic updates on this project as we move forward. Happy to facilitate those for you. Great. Thank you. Select woman Gilman. Uh, yes, I was just wondering, Ms. Perry, if you can remind me, are cap grants the ones that have uh, the many layers of oversight where you have to prove you've done certain work and then it goes back through, you know, certain hands. So it does take longer to get the, the um, sign off on the different um, activities that you've done or approved. Cause I, I kind of remember like a, a, a manual this big. That it is. It's about a two to three inch thick manual and you do have to be certified to administer those projects. Um, we only have a couple of people in the department that are certified. Um, and it is it is a fairly exacting um, process that you have to go through. There are checks for the checks and balances. Um, frequently, we have to have things done in almost in duplicate. Um, some of the processes, um, especially if you're dealing with any kind of appraisals or um, you have to have a second appraisal done. So, um, but I have to say that New Hampshire DOT has been um, good to work with on this project. They have been supportive and um, relatively quick to turn around materials that we do send to them. Thank you. And then the other question was at this point, and this goes to um, Ms. Knott's uh, question about the cost and is the money segregated, et cetera. Um, at this point, we can't shrink the size of the project, can we? 
so that if the cost goes up because of the you know inflation or whatever, then we do less projects. No, we can't really change the the scope or scale of the project because DOT has approved those. Mm-hmm. But sometimes there are opportunities to put in alternative um, bid structures that might allow for uh, less expensive materials and things of that nature. So um, we're certainly going to be paying attention to costs. We do not want to have to come back for any increases. Sure. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions from the board for Ms. Perry? Uh, before we move on, Ms. Nod, I see you still have your hand up. I wanted to give you an opportunity if you had a follow-up question or if, if your hand was just left up. I, I didn't want to move on without giving you an opportunity to ask. I, I do. Sorry, Nico. Thank you. No, that's okay. Um, so uh, I have two questions that got raised in that discussion. Um, one is what happens to the funds that we've already been allocated or allocated for this project if the town does not vote to extend the deadline? Um, and then the second question is is kind of parallel to that. Um, I, there will be a warrant article on the ballot in March, um, but will that warrant article really just be an extension or um, will we have to reapprove the project because it expires in December, which is before the time that we vote in March? Thank you. So my understanding is that we are only extending the period of authorization to complete the project. Uh, that's the way the warrant, the previous warrant articles were were written. Um, there was a deadline to have the project completed by such and such a date. So that's the only um, component that we would have in the new warrant article. It wouldn't to change the um, monetary amount. It wouldn't change, um, you know, whether or not the project should occur. It would just be to extend the timeline. And I, I just add to that by saying in a worst case scenario, if the appropriation did lapse, that we, uh, since we have already raised the money, what we could do is simply transfer it from our fund balance to, uh, for this purpose. Would that require a vote? They both require a vote, extending the deadline or transferring from fund balance. Okay. Thank you. One, uh, one other thing I'd add, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. It, keep in mind that one of the original pieces of deliberation around the project was the fact that this is a 2080 split between the town and the state. So the DOT, which of course is driving the bus on the project, with all of the rules and the regulations. I, I can remember a similar conversation around a baggage building project that we had some years back. Uh, fortunately, this isn't a building, it's, it's sidewalks and shoulder widening, but um, you know that is part of the process whenever you decide to accept state and federal funding by extension uh, to the ratio of 20% town, 80% federal funding, federal and state funding, uh, that it's a little bit more bureaucratic, the project process. So we will move it as quickly as we can, but um, just kind of, I just wanted to make that comment because it's always part of the equation whenever you're uh, dealing with state funds. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Any other questions from the public? And I'll pause for a moment to give people an opportunity to raise hands. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to, to the board real quick. Any last questions for Ms. Perry? No okay. questions for me. I would just um, like to thank Laura for for raising this. It's always good to have input and and you know reach out when you when you see something and want some answers. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have our third reading of the water restrictions amendment. And Madam Clerk, I'll turn that over to you. Okay. 
Uh, this is uh, uh, just a final reading of uh, amendments to the water restriction, Chapter 1610, um, where we are making the following changes. And again, I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I'm going to read the areas of change. So Chapter 16, Water Service Regulations, 1610, Water Use Re Restrictions. 1610.1 uh, merely changes the word select board, board of selectmen to select a board. That was easy. 1610.3, the requirements of this section shall apply to all water users with connections receiving water from the Exeter Water Department and under the state and federally declared drought conditions all well users within the town. So it applies to all well users, not just it. We added, we struck out the word residential. And then down further, uh, section 1610.8, exceptions to restrictions include the following, and we have added the grass playing turf of a recreational field, the grass playing services of a golf course, and grass agricultural field, fields, including fields used for the production of sod, may be excluded from the requirements of 1610.2. And I believe that is the end. That is the end. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, any questions from the board? Any comments from the board? Any questions or comments from the public? Um, and I'll pause for a moment. Okay, I see none. So this was our third reading. Um, and I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the water restrictions amendment as read by Selectwoman Gilman. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf? Aye. Selectwoman Cowan? Aye. Selectman Brown? Aye. Clerk says aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, next we have our COVID-19 updates and Chief Wilkin, there you appear. There I appear. Good <laughs> evening all and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, really quick, I apologize for missing uh, last the last meeting, but we'll get caught up here tonight. Um, the uh, town manager, Russ, and I, as well as the town, the town health officer, continue to monitor um, the, the numbers coming out of the state. And uh, I have to admit, the numbers I'm seeing are concerning, um, though New Hampshire is still one of the states with less than 1% uh, positivity rate. Uh, based on testing and those positive. When you see a thousand people over a two week span test positive and, and uh, almost, almost 300 in Rockingham County, uh, now is not the time to let our guard down. Now is not the time to be complacent. So uh, I know there's a lot in the news. This is politicized beyond belief, um, but I think if we keep it right here in Exeter and do everything we can uh, to protect our neighbors and ourselves, it goes without saying it's, it's where we need to go. Um, 10 Exeter residents tested positive in the past two weeks. We now have 76 still on the low side of communities our size, which is a, a compliment to all of our actions and your actions onto that. But uh, still, uh, um, it's, a, it's a number we want to see lower. Um, you probably heard the news. The governor took action uh, last Thursday, the 15th, and uh, temporarily suspended all youth hockey big blow to, to the programs and I know uh, I have a lot of friends that like playing hockey and that do and and this two week hiatus will hopefully allow some of the uh, some of the spread community spread to, to abate and uh, we can get back at it but um, not just uh, the rinks at Exeter but rinks all over the state were identified as uh, as problematic and that uh, we needed to take a breath with that and see we go um, James Murray and I, James was not able to be on tonight. I continue to monitor a couple of uh, what I call hot spots in Exeter. Uh, nothing the state has deemed an outbreak, but we're watching one or two positive cases uh, in these, and uh, we'll, we continue to report to you and uh, Russ on uh, where those are. Um, the fire department has seen an uptick 
in calls, COVID and COVID related uh, emergencies. Uh, we are burning through PPE over the last month uh, quicker than we had all summer. We had a very busy spring and then kind of slowed down, but um, from September and October, we've been busy. In fact, placed our first order for PPE um, just this morning to start replacing some of the things we've seen uh, get depleted. Not, uh, not you know, worrisome, but uh, we believe the state will still be able to fill things. Spoke with Paul Scafidi, and we're still going to be able to help with anything he believes he needs to supplement the uh, the state cash that we already have, and we look forward to assisting with the election coming up in November. Um, Fire, police, parks, and rec have all been working hard, and I'm sure you'll hear from Melissa and Greg soon as well, but uh, um, we're happy to supply an engine to, uh, to take uh, our uh, the Halloween um, parade around town on Saturday morning before trick-or-treating. And uh, it takes a bunch to make that happen. And uh, we've already begun conversations with, with our uh, Christmas or a uh, holiday season. I'll keep it at that as far as the decorating, uh, what we can do, what we perhaps ought not do, um, parades, locations, that. So all that is an ongoing effort. And uh, like I said, I hopefully Melissa and Greg will have more on that, but uh, we are happily to work with them on that as well. So, uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll pause here and see what else is out there for COVID updates and be ready to take any questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Are there any questions for Chief Wilking at this time? Okay, thank you for your update, Chief. Stand by. Thank you. We think of something. Um, we have uh, Mr. Bison, the Director of Parks and Rec and the Assistant Director, Melissa Roy with us this evening for an update. Uh, good evening. Uh, we'll start off, uh, Eric had mentioned the numbers going up. We did have to pause our programs uh, due to a, uh, a possible exposure last week. Uh, we worked with James Murray and uh, Russ and uh, all is good. We're, we're back uh, up and running, uh, monitoring and following our safety protocols. So that has worked well. Uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel the movie this past Saturday. Uh, the high winds prevented us from hanging our screen. The screen cannot withstand winds over 10 miles an hour, unfortunately, because it's not a, a regular screen as a drive-in. Uh, so we had to cancel that. The, the, the winds were too sustained, and it would have been uh, unsafe for the staff to set it up and everything, and we didn't want to disappoint people, get them there, just to tell them to go home. Uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, Melissa has been working diligently with uh, police and fire and uh, now our student council from the high school that will be participating in the, uh, the Halloween parade. We are going to be working on the route uh, this week and hopefully we'll produce it next week, uh, three days before the event. So uh, look for us, but just keep in mind that everyone that we cannot go to every neighborhood there are a lot of mileage <laughs> in this town so uh it would be almost impossible to go down every street but we're going to try to advertise it well enough where we encourage people just to try to walk and not gather if they need to see this uh we don't want it to create a parade atmosphere but we want to bring joy to the town and uh, yeah, we are, we're working. We're about to release a survey for winter programming to see uh, what the appetite for people are. But again, as we reiterated in our rec advisory board meeting, our number one goal is to keep all of our residents safe here in Exeter, providing recreational opportunities and to get the kids back to school. So that is our update. Melissa, did you have anything to add? No? Okay. Um, Mr. Bison, with regard to um, trick-or-treating, um, as we discussed in our last meeting, have you been able to advertise through various um, media outlets the recommendations, the restrictions, the time, um, the fact that it is purely voluntary and that if households do not want to participate, they will not put a light on and to be respectful of those that do not want to participate? Um, is, how's that effort going? Yes, uh, we've actually sent out a mass email through our database, which is about 5,000 people. Uh, mm -hmm. So if I, it, those emails went out with the restrictions and the guidelines. Uh, we've posted it on all the social media sites. We have it on WMUR as well as it's been in the newspaper. We're going to follow up with uh, Exeter Newsletter to reiterate the safety protocols that we're recommending and hopefully 
next week have them just to remind people to stay vigil- uh, vigilant. And if they don't feel comfortable, just don't turn on their light. And that's really what it's going to come down to. But it, I think it's a, it was a great move moving it to the day. So hopefully crowds will stay in their neighborhoods or relatively close, stay with their pods, uh, try to socially distance as much as possible. And, and candy givers, we can't emphasize enough. Don't have a giant bowl of candy that kids are going to continuously reach in and grab, have them individually wrapped, uh, put them on a table. Uh, one of the greatest things I just saw was uh, candy flowers now being thing, uh, taping your candy to a uh, wooden skewer that you would use for kebabs and put them in your lawn and kids can come and pick them off your lawn. So there's, Definitely plenty of ways for people to participate, keeping socially distanced and having a good, safe time. Select woman, Rattriola. Just, just wondering, uh, Greg, what email address do you guys use to send out mass mailings about updates like this? We use Constant Contact. Uh, so we have a Constant Contact. It would come from recreation at exeternh.gov. There is a link right on our website. If anyone would like our updates for our programs, they can do it. Uh, or if someone forwards you an email, there's also a link on that as well. So uh, those are two of the things that we use. So if somebody has gone through programming through Parks and Rec, they're not automatically on that list? No, they they have to opt in. We the. The one problem with our email server that uh, we use for recreational software, we it doesn't always go through because sometimes it is picked up as spam. Constant Contact prevents that. So we use that media uh, instead of our recreational software because too many times we'll have people call, like I registered my kid for programs. I did get a receipt, but they look in their spam folder and there it is. Right. So would it would it make sense at some point to reach out to folks because truth be told i just looked to see if i had received that email and i hadn't even though my kids were in a summer program uh through parks and rec to resend out to give people the option to opt in because they may not know like i just feel like the wider the the group that we can reach out to for information like this the better we can definitely send out something through our registration software or uh, I would say we'd probably harvest uh, that data off of our recreational software instead of sending it out and then send it out that way. Sounds good. Mr. Beeson, have there been any changes since you last met with us uh, with respect to restrictions or suggestions or guidelines? Well, as Eric mentioned, the uh, the guidelines for the youth sports are being examined. Uh, and we actually just mes- recently met last week as a state association for Parks and Rec. Surprising enough, we actually are already planning summer of 2021. So we're reviewing guidelines and DHHS has asked for recommendations on how to better suit the municipalities. Keep in mind, when they threw this together, this was the first set of guidelines they put out was summer camps. So a lot has changed, especially uh, there were some inconsistencies between different guidelines. Uh, For instance, one of the things at summer camps is they're they're really pushing wearing masks and keeping groups at 10. And then about a month and a half later, they came out with the youth sports guidelines which you could have a full squad playing on the field with no masks. So there was no consistency there, Uh, but we're working with uh, the state now. Uh, We've put our recommendations together as a group and uh, I'd be very fascinated to see what new protocols come out of the recent hockey shutdown. So that's something we're keeping our pulse on. Uh, And they're also, our DHHS has told us that they're going to re-examine fairs and festivals and, uh, other events, other gatherings. So whatever that means, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll find out as they go on. Okay, thank you. And finally, back to Halloween. Can we do something with Bob Kloacki and Channel 22 maybe as another means to uh, get the message out? Yes, definitely. Uh, Bob and I had talked about uh, doing a PSA. We can definitely have something work together. Uh, it was on uh, the weekly review by Hillary. Uh, that It was on there last week. So uh, it was something we can definitely work with, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Greg or Melissa from the board? Okay. Thank you. I know we'll be back to you in a moment. Uh, Mr. Dean. 
Uh, my only update really on the COVID front is uh, just wanted to acknowledge um, the effort with the rinks. It was uh, long. It was involved. It was uh, it required a lot of attention to detail as to what was happening over there. And I thought uh, James Murray did his uh, very best to get information out of the state uh, the best way that he could. And certainly, you know, I was involved at my level, uh, making a couple of calls myself and hearing from the associate attorney general on that issue. Uh, so that was that was good. Uh, obviously, it's a tough situation and hopefully they um, you know, they're able to turn it around. I, I think part of the conversation there is always about we know how important sports are for our kids. Uh, most of us have kids who play sports or certainly no kids who play sports. And, uh, you know, our intention there is not to shut things down. But when you have a situation like that, uh, it's it's pretty significant. And the state recognized that. And so 14 days it is. And hopefully uh, things turn around and they're able to look at the guidelines and and get the kids back on the ice the right way, uh, we hope. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But just wanted to acknowledge everyone's efforts on that. Great. Thank you. And, and you and James uh, did have a busy Saturday. <laughs> yes. Great. Great. Thank you for the updates. We'll move to our regular business. Uh, we do not have any abatements, credits, or exemptions. Uh, but we do have, um, looks like, two approvals or requests for approvals from Parks and Rec. So, Mr. Bison, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, first one in your packet. We love that people are really uh, participating in coming out to our parks. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is a major uptick in golfers. Uh, we had the occasional golfers here and there, but uh, we have several now that have been coming to our parks, both Brickyard and the Recreational Park. Uh, as you can tell, uh, they somewhat deem a little dangerous at Brickyard. Uh, and then that the recreational park, it's such a large uh, encompassing field. We've encountered uh, quite a few golf balls on the playing field and playing surface. So one of the things that we reached out and, and looked with other parks and rec is most of them will not allow recreational golfing at their parks uh, because if a golf ball would lend, end up in a mower, uh, it suddenly becomes a projectile. And if that thing gets launched out, uh, it could definitely hurt someone. So we've been very fortunate where our, our mowers have hit a few golf balls and chewed them up pretty good and spit them out. And, uh, but no one was around, so no one got hurt. So I'm asking the board to consider uh, making an overall uh, ordinance or policy to not have golfing at any of our parks. Okay. Any questions or comments from the board? Mr. Dean, I don't know if ordinance is the right um, avenue here. I think we're just, to, for tonight, the purposes of tonight, Mr. Chairman, just looking for a vote to do this. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we will we will post it appropriately at the parks, at the rec park. I don't, I don't know that we have another park that we would need to post it at. Ho hopefully not, but we think it through. But the vote that we'd ask for is just to support the, the ban of golfing at our parks. I have a question. Could we could we ban leaving golf balls at the parks and, and allow golfing? Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, Greg didn't hit on too, everything, but it's also a safety issue. I mean, I'm a golfer. I play golf. You go out there and hit a driver at the rec park, you can hit, hurt somebody. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see that. But I also, I wonder if there's a way to, can we, can we like allow for putting on in our rec parks, which don't hurt people, and then you have to pick up your golf balls. And if you don't, then in two weeks, we're going to ban golfing at our rec parks. I, I, I mean, and I don't know that I... I'm especially, you know, tied to this, but I also wonder if there's a way that we can also, you know, encourage people to be outside and socially distanced and being in fresh air while also making sure that everybody is safe and not leaving their golf balls to be 
projectile out of the mowers. That's Molly. actually easy. Sorry, easier said than done, Molly. Uh, having been a golfer and you lose a ball in the high rough, uh, the grass is about maintained about two and a half inches to three. So a golf ball could easily we pick up on average four to six a week of golf balls. So uh, some of them in plain sight, which is amazing that they haven't been picked up, especially on an infield, but uh, some of them are just in the grass. And then you have a very, a number of people <laughs> running around, especially at, uh, at the rec park in that brickyard, that one little step could twist an ankle. So that's something that I wouldn't recommend. Uh, it is a safety issue, both for players on the field, people possibly being up there if they're, they're, hitting golf balls at the same time or even uh, to the fact that, again, a projectile or if, God forbid, someone slices one into on 111 when they, they're hitting a brickyard or at uh, towards a nursing home or Churchill's and hits someone, it definitely could uh, hurt them. Okay, you've convinced me. Select women round triolas. I'm sorry, did you say four to six golf balls a week? Yes. Yeah. Okay. My, my guys have been collecting them. Some of them don't look so good after they've uh, collected them, by the way. No, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just not as um, thrown off by four to six golf balls a week. If, if it was 40, 20, <laughs> I, I don't know. Perhaps it's just my... I think there's something to be said about um, increasing the number of restrictions that we're putting out for accessibility for those who want to utilize the parks. I'm more apt to hear restrictions on the time frames in which people are using golf balls and golfing. Um, when people aren't on the field, but to have completely empty fields out there that we're restricting of certain things, but not other things. I don't know. I'm not convinced. I think this is also a liability issue. And I think if our carrier knew that we were sort of yeah. enforcing playing golf out at our rec park, I think they would have a real issue with that. There's a difference between enforcing, encouraging, and you know, what other things are we asking people not to do in certain areas that... And if most parks in the state are not allowing this, I think we ought to follow suit and not allow it. Are most parks in the state not allowing this? That's what yeah, Mr. Bison said his survey. What was the survey? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, most of them have golf courses located right in their uh, right in their communities. So Rochester, Dover, Portsmouth all do not allow golfing at their 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 facilities. Okay, and what's offered to those who cannot afford to utilize it? Can somebody turn off their? There's a lot of feedback. Sorry. Um, what's offered to those who say that they can no longer afford um, the parks and rec? Like, is there a discount then? Are we offering for people who can't afford to play golf? Unfortunately, we don't have a golf course to offer a discount to. Oh. Uh, none, none of those communities. All uh, Kachiko is private. Uh, Rochester Country Club is a private golf course. Uh, Pease is a public golf course but no, we don't offer anything like that. Okay. And how many people are we talking about that we've had uh, instances with? Handful, three to four. That's more than it used to be just one, but now it's up to three to four. Uh, by, uh, sometimes five mm -hmm. people who drive in golf balls. We've also heard that uh, some kids that are participating in soccer have actually rolled their ankles on golf balls down there. So, that's another issue that we've, we're contending with with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I very much admit that I don't know anything about golf. So if, if you are, I mean, I, I worry about the, the accessibility too, but I also, you know, if you don't golf outside of golf courses, then okay. And I don't want, I, that part is the most concerning. If we are leaving golf balls on playing fields and kids are getting hurt, 
But yeah, I know nothing about golf. It can be expensive. Hurts yeah. when you get hit by a ball. I can tell you that. <laughs> that actually has happened. I, yes, I've been hit by a golf ball before. Yeah. I know that much about golf. So do we do we have a place where maybe we can designate people to go if they feel so inclined to drive golf balls? Exeter Country Club. I mean, yeah, but as I get it's back to the expense thing, I mean, yeah. it costs money. I mean, we could we could explore. Maybe there's a discount program we could look into with ECC if there's a collaboration to be had there. We could do that. Mm-hmm. I, I was wondering, uh, Mr. Chair, if this might be a question for the Conservation Commission, um, because there's such a broad scope of land that the town owns. Um, but usually with the um, easements, et cetera, there are rules of conduct, basically. Um, but there might be some property out there somewhere that we don't mow very often. And uh, although playing in the rough is really rough if we don't mow very often. <laughs> No, but I think, it's, I think it's worth looking into, you know, maybe we don't have a place, but, you know, I, I agree. I think it's a discussion to be had before yeah. we ban folks who don't have the accessibility like some others who are lucky enough to afford golfing as a leisurely activity, especially for old population. I think we should really look into it. I'd be happy to contact uh, the extra country club and, and start that dialogue. Can we also look into what Julie mentioned in terms yeah. of public spacing? Sure. What well, I will contact Kristen Murphy and start that conversation as well. I like that idea. Great. Thank you. Back to the request, though, for the um, for the parks, particularly the rec park, the Brickyard Park, and Gilman Park. I mean. You know, I, I'd like to be able to find a place for people to go because, again, golfing golfing can be expensive. Um, however, um, you know, the equipment aside, th there are safety concerns for kids. Um, you know, and I think to, to Mr. Dean's point, I'm sure Primex wouldn't be happy to know that um, this was going on. So how does the board feel about making a motion for the parks while we look into alternate locations i'd be in favor of a motion i think the uh, legal liability and insurance exposure is not interesting <laughs> select women around trail off i would like to hold off but we'll all vote i assume <laughs> um selectman brown was that a motion it was not, but I'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> hold my hand. I'll make one. What's the, um, um, how do we want to structure this? It's a motion to, well, I guess, Mr. Bison, can you restate what you'd like to see? Uh, for the Parks and Recreation Department to uh, look into prohibiting golfing at their athletic parks. I think, we can, I think we can make it simpler. Maybe I'll make the motion, Daryl, and you can second it. Okay. Uh, uh, I move to prohibit golfing in town recreational parks for a period of, I want to say, 60 days in order to get the Conservation Commission on board. Um, they won't meet. Well, 60 days is a lot, so I'll say uh, 30, and we'll see. So 30 days from today. I'll second that. It's like we're in the list. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you repeat that in its entirety, Julie? I will try. Um, uh, I move to suspend, was it suspend or uh, prohibit? Uh, Joanna's looking at me. You used <laughs> okay. the word prohibit. I did? You did. Okay. To prohibit the use of uh, uh, the use of the Exeter Recreation Parks for golf use for 30 days. Golfing? 
Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, Selectwoman Rautriol, if your hands up. Okay, I didn't know if you had another comment. Uh, any further comments? We have a motion and a second. Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Uh, Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf. Nay. Selectwoman Cowan. No. Selectwoman, Selectwoman, Selectwoman Brown, sorry. That's okay, aye. Uh, clerk says aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. Selectwoman Roundtree Olaf, I didn't hear your vote. I said nay. Nay, okay, so the motion passes three to two. So 30 days from today would be probably before or right around our, our last November meeting. And Mr. Bisson, in the meantime, you'll follow up with Kristen Murphy, please. Yes, I'll follow up with everyone. Um, okay, you have another proposal regarding the kids park and um, dogs. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize that this uh, did not come when you were discussing the dog ordinance or when you were doing it for Gilman Park, but it was been brought to my attention the last uh, couple of weeks that we have a potential dog problem at Kids Park. As you know, we just renovated the park this past spring. It has seen a large influx of kids coming in. But people are still, uh, well, actually are now using the green space as a place to bring their dogs in to the parks because it is fenced in. So they're taking them off leash and letting them do their business. Uh, when we have a lot of kids running around there, especially on the grass, uh, I'm asking that we actually reconsider and put this in the dog ordinance to not or to prohibit dogs from kids park. Okay. Any discussion or question from the board? Mr. Beeson, I'm confused. I thought that the, the dog ordinance was just for Gilman Park. The, the town uh, dog ordinance is, lists all the parks in it. Okay. We just, uh, for some reason, Townhouse Common is not listed and neither is Kids Park. Uh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Kids Park is dogs. the one, to, yeah, I prohibiting okay. dogs. I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, that brings up the question of whether, <laughs> excuse me, if, if we add Kids Park, maybe we add Townhouse Common at the same time, and does that cover all of our parks? That would include all our parks now, if we did that. Okay. Well, that's a consideration. I, I'm... Um, for kids park i think there is a uh, that's a problem with uh, off leash dogs and uh whether or not they get cleaned up after i'm um townhouse common not really an unleashable place but um i'm not a dog owner so any other questions or comments from the board Okay. Would anybody, um, I'd entertain a motion at this time, if the board was inclined. Select woman Cowan. Sorry, I was going to ask Julie if she had a question. She's got her hand up. Oh. <laughs> I think that was from the last question. <laughs> okay. I can I, let me go back to the agenda. Let me um, get exactly what you need for the motion. I'm stuck on the water ordinance. And then to select Gilman, uh, select woman Gilman's um, point, you know, the board should consider whether to include townhouse comment. Uh, well, I mean, I would be amenable to including townhouse common. So should I just make that motion? 
I believe if we did it that way, that would be inclusive of all of the parks, correct, Mr. Bisa? If I understood you correctly? That is correct. Okay. Um, okay, so I will move to um, to include the kids park and townhouse common in the current dog ordinance. Second. Uh, Select one, Gilman. Yeah, uh, for part of the discussion, um, Mr. Bison, if uh, the gas works area is actually a park on Green Street. Uh, oh, uh, that's not a park we maintain. Okay. So that that's I believe Phillips Exeter or some. I really don't actually know. I've seen private contractors mowing it and doing cleanup. That's interesting. Okay. That's it for me. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Select woman round Triolif. Yeah. Yes. Select woman Cowan. Aye. Select woman Brown. Aye. The clerk says aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bison. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Thank you. Okay, we have um, Director Perry back uh, with a recommendation uh, regarding uh, the charge for septage and including this as a new fee in the town fee schedule. Um, Ms. Perry? Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Sorry. I'm going to go back to without headphones. I can't hear you that well. Um, this is a, uh, a pilot that we have been conduct conducting for the last several months. We have been taking septage from commercial waste haulers at the new wastewater treatment plant. Um, we wanted to make sure that this was an operation that we could accommodate with our new facility. We wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be any upsets to our operations. Um, and that it wouldn't be a problem as far as our discharge permit goes. And um, it's been successful. We have been charging approximately eight, not approximately, we have been charging eight cents per gallon for commercial haulers. And that was based on um, current rates that are being charged by other wastewater treatment facilities in the region. It ranges anywhere from seven to 10 cents per gallon. Um, and that allows us to be able to treat um, the waste, the septage, which is fairly, um, it, it's a lot stronger uh, waste than what we receive at the, the influent to the plant from a, a normal um, uh, residential unit. And it still allows for the cost for that treatment, the energy, the disposal costs. And um, at this point, we're anticipating it's approximate net of four cents per gallon. Um, it might be less than that because we did not try to capture every single cost that's associated with that. But in large part, we do feel that this would be um, to the benefit of the town. And there are several reasons for doing this. One, we did allow for this in the design of the new treatment plant um, by allowing the town to now take septage, which we have not in the past. Um, we were uh, eligible for additional grant funding through the wastewater program. Um, the septage actually is food for the microorganisms. And what we do is we, we basically pump it into our system during the night when our flows are down. And it allows the microorganisms to continue, um, op not operating, but continue functioning and doing the treatment that they do. And it allows people to, um, to discharge more locally. And so, you know, if people are say, uh, or waste haulers are, are pumping septic systems in Exeter, they're not having to transport it to Hampton or further away. So it, it keeps it local. Um, so we, we feel that it's it's uh, totally within our capacity to handle. We think it's a good, good for the environment. It's not going to necessarily increase our nitrogen loads because all of this is essentially removed in um, 
in the uh, sludge production. And that's why we wanted to present this to you and, and make a recommendation to include that four cents a gallon in the fee structure of the town. Four cents or eight cents? I'm, excuse me, eight cents. You're correct. Select woman Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of my questions is uh, if this, my, my uh, knowledge of leaf fields that are, are uh, long past whatever today's technology is. <laughs> so my question is, will this aid us at all in decreasing our non-point source uh, fluids? <laughs> That's a tough question to answer. Uh, what this will, that would, ex that would require people to potentially be increasing their pumpage more frequently, their septic pumpage. Um, and that's really a human behavior, if you will. We certainly encourage people. We do uh, issue regular reminders for septic owners to pump, you know, anywhere from two to five years, more typically three years on average. Um, that's really important for the, the health and functioning of their system and, and prolonging its life. If you don't pump your septic system, it's not going to last very long. So, um, you know, yeah, it, it will potentially increase it if people increase their pumping or decrease their, their non-point discharge, excuse me. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, I would entertain a motion then um, to continue to charge for septage at eight cents per gallon and establishing this is a new fee in the town fee schedule. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second, Select Woman Gilman. Um, uh, for discussion, do we need to include in the motion that it's private septage, or is that ad adequate the way it is, Ms. Perry? I think that it's it's adequate. Um, I could see that there could be a commercial operation or something that's larger than a residential operation. Typically, when the trucks come in, um, they're a 500 gallon truck, so. Um, it could t potentially be commercial, and that's not a problem as long as it's only human waste and it's not any kind of industrial byproduct. That's not what the intention of this is. But we have communications with all the septage haulers. They know that if they ever brought us what we call a hot load, um, that'll be the last time that they make a delivery to us. So we're very protective of the process. We've got to make sure that it doesn't, um, you know, upset our operation. Good, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Select woman Roundtree Olive. Aye. Select woman Cowan. Aye. Select woman Brown. Aye. Clerk says aye, Mr. Chair. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Okay, moving along, uh, Mr. Dean and the town manager's report, please. Okay, um, the only real thing I wanted to mention tonight, because uh, we've been talking about dogs, is there is an issue that's been brought to my attention about that we do, in fact, allow dogs in the town offices, and um, that is a long-standing practice that we have allowed, and it's been brought to me on a couple of different occasions by our staff that they are interested in not having dogs in this building. So I just wanted to raise that with the board because I know for some people it can be a, a difficult subject, but um, the reality is for two years or three years in a row now, we've had to have flea treatments in the tax collector's office because of dogs being in the lobby. And so it's really created an issue. So uh, I plan on bringing it back to the board at another night, but I just wanted to at least uh, warm you up to the idea that, uh, that is an issue for us that, that we're dealing with. Um, 
other than that, my report was mainly it's all about budget and finances right now. And uh, I think I have mentioned to the board that we did get a clean audit and we plan on having Ed Boyd from Lance and Heath on the call on November 9th. So uh, if the board can, we'll get the audits out to you and so you can warm up with any questions that you have for Ed and Melanson. Um, happy to report a clean audit again. That's, that's really great. Uh, we're continuing to work on uh, the MS-1, the assessing uh, document that we need to submit to the state. Once we do that, we can have our tax rate setting happen. Um, and we also need to discuss uh, the fund balance policy at the board meeting probably next week, just to reconfirm what our plans are to, uh, to propose applying uh, a certain amount of fund balance to lower the tax rate. And beyond that, I think that was everything I had, unless the board members have questions of me. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. Uh, Slocum Brown? Yeah, just about the um, dog issue. So we're not proposing anything. So we've got ADA and service animals to allow, so there's nothing we can do there. Are you Co correct? It, it would not include service animals, of course. Uh, it would be just more of a general prohibition, correct? Okay. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Dean? Great. Thank you for your report, Russ. You're welcome. Um, select board committee reports. Uh, we'll start Selectman Brown. Uh, I had uh, at least one communications committee meeting. Uh, they're very close to publishing a survey and we talked about um, Bob and uh, Greg have both pushed their uh, initiatives through the website and all proper channels to get the information out there. And I missed the uh, facilities committee meeting, but um, you know, they're uh, moving along on wrapping things up for the budget re uh, recommendations. And uh, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, select woman Roundtree Olaf. The housing committee meeting met on October 9th and we had a update from Maggie Randolph, um, who they have a project that they're working on in Durham, basically working on small houses. And so they did a presentation to our board, Darren Wynnum invited them um, and Sarah Reitzman. Really interesting presentation they gave on sort of creating smaller, small house communities for more affordable housing. Um, nothing actually on the table, but sort of a preliminary conversation. That is the only update. Okay. Thank you very much. Select woman Gilman. Um, Slip on Roundtree Olaf, I, I was very interested in that uh, small house thing because we just had some or are having some legislation on tiny houses. Um, the difference being that what the legislation is that the state has tiny houses on wheels so you can move them somewhere else. Um, but I saw the article about this couple that are doing the development in Dover and, and talked to uh, uh, Darren immediately or Nancy Belanger and said, get these people in here. We want to hear more. How do they do that? Anyway, for me, um, the Conservation Commission had a special all boards kind of meeting where they invited uh, all the land use boards to a Zoom meeting to talk about uh, climate change and uh, sea, rise, sea rise and storm surge um, and how it would affect the decisions made by each body. Um, and it went really well. People were, were had forgotten some of the reports that we've had done over the years, like Sea Rise and Cape, and um, there's four or five different ones, and of course I can't remember them. But um, just as a reminder that these reports exist out there, and you know, refresh yourselves on how um, Sea Rise might affect the plan for some development closer to the water than you know, even within our boundaries. Um, and also with the Conservation Commission, we had a couple of different things. People came in just for uh, an opinion about where they might go forward. Um, Ford wants to expand parking and uh, 
uh, developer has a conceptual design for Charter Street and the, con the commission had some questions about both projects. Uh, one would clean up a site significantly and the other would change <laughs> change things. So uh, they'll be back when they have a better um, development plan. And then the, um, the academy just came in for uh, a conditional use permit for changing or uh, repairing the um, hill bridge over the river on their property that they need to, uh, they're going to revamp the underlings, repair a little bit of concrete and dig up the uh, uh, riprap that's been sedimented over the years. You wouldn't, if you look at the pictures of when it was first installed and at it now, you, you'd not know, recognize the property as the same bridge. And that is it. Thank you. Oh, no, wait. Um, I told you last month that I was, our last meeting, I was going to have a lot of meetings. Uh, the last one is the HDC had a really quick meeting uh, because, the, again, our permits are, are working out really well. Um, the Sea Dog owners came in uh, looking for awnings uh, in the rear over their uh, balconies, uh, more permanent awnings. Um, because of, you know, expanding the outside dining and, you know, how long is this going to go? They need, need more shelter for their um, patrons. Um, and so those are fine. They, they're using good materials. They're actually chose to match the color of the building, which is not a requirement of the town, but it, it, it went over well. And then um, our first... I think it's our first residential solar installation up on High Street was approved, and it's massive. <laughs> but it's all going on roofs, and, and uh, that's why they had to add up a lot of different um, um, layouts of it so they could get the big bang for the buck. But it was really it was really nice to be able to say yes, this is a historic district, but this is a um, an amenity that we need to provide for. So. And that is it. Thank you. Selectwoman Cowan. Uh, yes, so we had a, a planning board meeting where we discussed um, the beginnings of one case. And uh, we also discussed the uh, changes that the academy was hoping to make to one of the barns on campus. Um, and it was really fascinating what they were doing with um, or proposing with moss roofs. And anyway, it was very, it's very cool. We're still in the, in the discussion process because not all of the um, pieces of the project were, were ready for prime time. Um, and then I also had a water and sewer advisory committee and I am glad that Jennifer Perry from DPW is still on um, because we, we encountered a problem that is, I think, driven by the pandemic that the, the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee did not feel comfortable addressing or creating a new policy um, and thought it should be something that is a higher level discussion with the select board and DPW. Um, so what has happened, there was a family, um, and I don't know how widespread it is, if it is even widespread, but what happened is because of the pandemic, um, there are usually two people who live in this house and um, everybody else is sort of dispersed. But with the pandemic, they had their two sons home from college. They had another part of the family move home because you know somebody lost their job and then somebody else uh, moved in because they also lost their job. And so what, what, that, ha what that did was it, it bumped them from a tier one water usage um, you know, calculation for their water bill into a tier two. And, and they were, you know, they came wondering if there was any way that they could be charged just for the tier one, because this was purely a pandemic occurrence and, you know, people had been out of work and, you know, this wouldn't be a normal occurrence, but is there any sort of relief that the town can give? Now, the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee did not feel comfortable um, coming up with a stance on their own. So that's why I'm bringing it to to the select board and um, and you know seeing if there this is a policy that we want to adopt, if there's any sort of, I don't imagine that there is, but if there's any sort of state funding that allows for this, or if we can bypass and simply charge people 
for the water they use, but under the rate that they would have been had it not been a pandemic and had, you know, people not been forced to move back in with them. So this, you know, this is not maybe necessarily the appropriate time to come up with something like this, but just wanting to take everybody's temperature. And if it's worth having a discussion at a later point, what should the discussion pieces be? Is this something that, you know, one of the things that was was talked about was maybe we have we have this happen until the pandemic there, you know, there's no emergency order anymore. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, we don't have the answers, just wanting to, to bring it back to you all. So I know uh, select woman Gilman, um, you have a question, but I wanted to ask select woman Cowan, am I, are you suggesting, are you suggesting like keeping, if there's, let's say six or eight people move in to the, to the dwelling because of the pandemic, keeping it at a tier one or, keeping it at the rate they would be paying if it were two or three people living there? No, like paying for, I mean, the, so the family, the family was asking for to be charged at the tier one level, oh, not okay. keeping, you know, with the understanding that they were using this extra water that they right. should pay for, just not wondering if they could be charged at the rate that they would have been had everything been normal. Under, understood. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, select woman Gilman. Yeah, I guess uh, my thought is I, I agree. Something needs to be happen. Needs to happen there. We have no idea how many cases are like that. And I would, I would, I would argue that everybody with their children at home probably have a higher water bill than they did before. Um, but I think we need to look at it a little more in depth. I think Ms. Perry needs to have some input and, and uh, Mr. Barubi um, about. Estimating, because <laughs> I, I don't even know how to put it. If if that's adequate to just do tier one for, uh, no matter what your circumstances are, I really, I'm not saying this right, but I don't want to penalize people for taking care of their families. Um, so I I I would say yes, keep them at tier one, and that's going to be uh, I think for Mr. Dean and finance to figure out how that billing change would happen. So it's not something we can vote on tonight, but um, I'd really like to find a solution. I, I would offer one consideration for the board, um, and that is how something like that is administered, because we certainly don't know how many people are living in a household. We purely are reading meters and charging based on volume of, of water and sewer. Um, and that's, you know, based on normal usage, that's how we've developed the tier one and then tier two and tier three. Um, so I, I guess the, that would be another question or consideration is how would that be administered? Because we wouldn't normally um, just put that out there. We wouldn't say, oh, normally you only use X amount. Now you're mo using Y amount. Do you have more people? Um, that would be a huge uh, effort on our part. And I'm sure we would still miss some people. So if something like that were to be considered, um, we'd have to come up with some kind of a, a protocol um, that would be unique. and an application. Mm -hmm. You'd have to have an application and approving process allow people to petition within a time frame with evidence that they have an increased number of people living in their house. I mean, I think this is a one-off. We hope that it's not a, a constant, but giving people the opportunity to at least express their need for extenuating circumstances would be, I think, a fair thing to do. I agree with that. Yeah, I would be, I mean, I would be comfortable with something like that because, you know, the way that this family, this particular family described it was, you know, they wouldn't have thought anything of it had the dad not lost his job too, you know, so it's like, um, and then, you know, and then they did some investigating because it was, you know, while the water usage was up, the, the cost was so much higher. And then that's how they discovered, oh, we're in tier two. And, you know, anyway, so I think it's probably something that we don't need to apply across the board, because I agree, Jennifer, it would be completely impossible 
for you all to determine, you know, okay, is this a leak? Is this, you know, people just are home from college? Is this a, you know, job loss or whatever it is. But I also think if we could have the ability for people to come before like they do with an abatement, um, and just have the water and sewer advisory committee say, sure, you know what? You, now that you've you've come before the board, you've said, here's why we think we should be charged in a tier one or a tier two rather than a higher tier. Then we can have the ability to say, okay, yes, if there's a pandemic going on, we're gonna we're gonna do that with the understanding that people still need to pay for their water and sewer usage. So that's that's not the question. The question is just, you know, seeing if we can provide some relief for people. Tied to COVID-19. Right. It would have to be proven out that COVID-19 was one of the causing factors. Yeah, I would say, that Mr. Dean, what you had talked about before about changing process or a different application, um, and I don't know how, how to call for a proof of change or something like that, but um, just the board adopting some method, I guess, for this kind of thing to occur. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'm thinking about too is whenever we talk about these issues, I always keep thinking about the federal assistance, the CARES Act money, the second round of funding, and just my, my urge is always for all of us to talk to as many of our representatives, our senators as possible and say, these are the kinds of situations really where if whatever you call it, whether it's targeted aid or a bucket of money, that these are the real life examples of some things that are happening on the ground that we really you know, could use federal support for because uh, they are related to the pandemic. And I would be happy, I can work with Bob um, from Water and Sewer and come up, you know, like we have our abatement process in place that the select board approved um, and then they just use it to determine whether or not somebody is uh, qualified for an, for an abatement. We could come up together with something that would cover this circumstance and present it at the next, you know, I don't know, maybe not next meeting, but the meeting following the election. So I was going to suggest that would be a reasonable amount of time. Ms. Perry, would you agree for on your end if we could revisit this on the 9th of November? Yes. Okay. And I'd be happy to work with you, Molly and, and Bob Kelly on, you know, making sure that we're covering all the bases. Sure. Because it, it's not meant for you all to have to do anything. Um, but it would be helpful to have your uh, your input and guidance here. Yeah. Great. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, I did not have any committee meetings, though I did participate uh, along with Select Women Gilman in the Exeter Climate Forum, uh, which I thought was a valuable hour and a half well spent. Um, and it was nice to see um, a large number of committee members from all of the committees. Um, and they had really interesting breakout sessions that um, that I thought were useful because you had different committee members coming from different angles. So I th thought that was, that was well done. Um, and thank Kristen Murphy for putting that together. There's a budget recommendations committee, the police and fire subcommittee will be presenting this Wednesday for those that can attend. And with that, Mr. Dean, we'll get into the correspondence. Um, the first few pages were Primex and the health trust look like the property and casualty workers comp, unemployment and health insurance renewal policies. Right. Any, any questions on those? Just let me know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. do, do we, we don't need to authorize you to, to do anything with those. Correct. Uh, no, you okay. do not. Okay. And let's see next we have, um, the update on the wastewater SAG update? Yes. Um, that's the uh, latest and greatest information on the status of the state aid grant. Uh, that came from DES. 
mm -hmm. uh, direct, and you can see that the um, you know the list they talk about se several eligible projects from the list of seventy that were not processed before the economic impacts of the current pandemic. So the SAG awards and payments for these projects are currently on hold until actual revenue shortfalls are known and or New Hampshire receives some type of stimulus funding to assist with revenue shortfalls in the Exeter project falls in this category. So that's the official word from DES on that. And then the other piece of the puzzle here is I just wanted to show uh, the details. We're actually number 60 on the list. Um, and you can see the total grant estimate. And that was as of April 30th, 2019. So that number has changed slightly, but over the course of this project, the town was actually slated to get four, over $14 million in grant funds, grant offsets for the new facility. So uh, obviously it's a very important uh, piece of financial support mm -hmm. and hopefully we can keep uh, impressing upon the state and the legislators that we're actually uh, geared up to get 861 for the 2021 allotment. You can see it's even higher than the 708. So um, just really wanna keep encouraging. I mean, the, what I'm hearing, and I'm trying to verify this, maybe Selectwoman Gilman can help us out with this at some point, but that the state still has a $100 million rainy day fund uh, that they're, they have in hand. So um, that was one of the main factors when we lobbied for this originally back in the spring was the fact that the state did have that kind of uh, money on hand and that it was worth reinstituting this program that's been so successful. So I just wanna keep that on people's front burners because it's a big number. Select woman, Rob Triola. I have a final comment statement, so I'll wait until um, Russ is done with with correspondence, and then I'll chime in. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next, uh, Mr. Dean, it looks like we have an update from the estate of Mr. Donahue. Right, that's just a notice that's required under the RSA, uh, 554-18A, and it requires us to be noticed anytime there's a um, a state that is in, I believe it's in just uh, going through some kind of uh, probate or not, you know, not uh, attested to. It's kind of an obscure law, but it, it requires them to notify the town when this happens. Okay, thank you. And then we have a notice from Mr. Berube to the EPA, which is the quarterly progress report for the third quarter. Correct. Yes. And uh, things are going well in that regard. So we're keeping up. Terrific. And last, um, Parks and Rec sent us some pictures of the pavilion at Gilman Park. Yes. And that was um, partially or mostly to announce, A, that the project's completed and the pavilion's painted. So uh, it's ready to use at least until winter comes. And then it's probably going to get used during winter time too, I would imagine, some way. Right. So terrific. Thank you. Great addition to the parks. Okay, real quickly, review of our calendar, October 26th, next Monday, um, November 9th, um, and then November 23rd. And of course, all the budget recommendation committee meetings that we can attend. We have the election, um, obviously, on the 3rd. So with that, before we adjourn, to, uh, select women around Triolov. Yeah, so I just wanted to make a quick comment, sort of circling back to um, the presentation that we had from both Tanisha and Cliff earlier this evening. And I, I kind of want to say something because it's, it's problematic for me that when we have conversations and talking points are brought up about concerns that we may have about citizens in our town, and it concerns whether it's economic, racial, or whatever, that we all show respect and we take the same respect that we give to other topics of conversation that we give to that. So if we're discussing whether it be trash bags or golfing, if I or someone else on the committee says that we want to discuss it because we think it concerns the equity of those who live in town and want to access things, I think it's, it's disrespectful for it to be flippantly said 
oh, just use the Exeter, you know, golf course or private club. We hold a role here in this town, and I think it's important that we hold and uphold what we expect those who live in town to do. So for me, it's very important that we do take the time to recognize that not everybody in this town can do what we as individuals have access to. So we go above and beyond to make sure that we do the work necessary to provide that for them. That's for other adults, other children, older folks, the gamut. So I really, you know, that's my personal opinion and I can't leave this meeting without saying something about it because this is kind of exactly what was brought up when Tanisha and Cliff came on saying that we have to show respect and appreciation and equity to those who live in this town and who also sit on the board. So just kind of wanted to say that before we ended because otherwise we don't get to share comments with each other, but this is sort of my last statement and that's it. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, at this time I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Madam Clerk. And select woman round here. Aye. Aye. Select woman Cowan. Aye. Duckman Brown. Aye. Clerk says aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. We stand adjourned. Good night. Thank you, everybody.